listening to Radio Sputnik. Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. Sadly, there are no donkeys, at least not on Keir Starmer's field in Surrey. Sadly, even more sadly, he has no parents. The only donkeys are those braying on social media all day in defense of Sir Keir Landsman, including many who spent the last five years aiding and abetting every smear against their former leader, Jeremy Corbyn. It's not that you can't be rich and be a socialist. It's not that you can't be a millionaire and be a Labour leader. What you can't be is someone who denies that they are a millionaire, but only because they're actually a multi-millionaire. Discuss, I certainly will be. And talking of donkeys, where is Joe Biden? Well, even Joe Biden doesn't know where Joe Biden is. But sadly, we know where Donald Trump is. He's got his finger on the button. And not just the nuclear button, not just the coronavirus button. He's got his finger on the button of regime change operations everywhere most notably in the last week or two in Venezuela. And Britain, believe it or not, is up to its neck in the scandal. And we'll be talking, of course, about coronavirus. And we'll be asking, is it safe to let your children return to schools? A yes, B no. Well, Harrow and Eton and Wellington and the like, they're returning in September. So if you think the answer to that is yes, you're a donkey too. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. This is Radio Sputnik. And this, of course, is London, but broadcasting to you all over the world, thanks to the wonders of the internet and sputniknews.com. We're on FM in Washington, D.C. If you want to listen in perfect clarity, 105.5 are the magic numbers there. And on AM throughout the United States, from coast to coast. But 535,000 of you last week watched the show as well as listened. And if you're one of those watching on Facebook, then please right now share, share this with everyone on your contacts list because we're still a way short of that 1.17 million figure that we achieved in episode 29. You can watch on my Facebook page, on RT's multiple Facebook pages. You can watch on my YouTube channel and do subscribe if you're doing that. And you can watch on RT's multiple YouTube channels. You can even watch on Twitter. You can even watch on Instagram. It's truly a remarkable global university, this. Now let me deal right at the start with something that's been causing waves today. There are no donkeys, and alas, Keir Starmer has no parents. Uh, but he does have a seven-acre field of prime development land in Surrey, which a land developer calculates is worth, even on today's depressed figures, 10 million pounds. Now, as I said at the beginning, you can be rich, and be a socialist. You can be a millionaire and be a labor leader. But what you can't be is someone who denies that they are a millionaire, when in fact it turns out they are a multi-millionaire. What you can't be is someone who deceitfully conceals the fact that they are in a financial relationship with other millionaires who are funding their 
campaign to become the leader of the Labour Party. And it is astounding to me that so many people needed persuading of that in the course of the day on social media. And some of those who've been braying like donkeys in defence of Sir Keir Landsman are those that aided and abetted every single smear against their former leader, Jeremy Corbyn. You really couldn't make it up. Neither could you make up what's happening in the United States. You couldn't make up the fact that the President of the United States said we have 15 cases and they're all going to disappear. And now they have hundreds and thousands of cases and almost 100,000 people dead. You can't make up that the Democrats have put up such a candidate as Joe Biden to face calamity Donald in November. A man who doesn't know how to say his name, even with a teleprompter, doesn't know what state he's in, doesn't know what office he's running for, doesn't know his wife from his sister, but has his wife or maybe his sister next to him all the time doing all the talking. This is a farce. And as I've said to you before, nothing says the decline of the United States empire like Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. We'll be talking to the wonderful Rachel Blevins in just a few minutes on that very subject. Rachel has become extremely popular indeed on this side of the Atlantic as she already was on her own. We'll be talking about the coronavirus crisis in the United States and around the world, and of course, here in Britain, where calamity Boris Johnson is calling for our children to go back to school, having, I think, last Sunday called on us to go back to work. On Monday, he said. No, not Monday, said his deputy, Wednesday. And now that everyone is being forced back to work, they've got to be alert. I'm being as alert as I possibly can to the coronavirus, although it is one one thousandth of a hair's breadth in width. So you've got to be really alert in order to catch it. I know this that the closer I get to the more people I get, the more chance I've got of becoming infected with coronavirus. That much I didn't need to be a rocket scientist to work out. And when I factor in that Britain's so-called public schools Note to Americans, everything means the opposite in Britain to what the word actually means in the dictionary. A public school is actually a private school for which you pay through the nose to send your children. They're not going back. They're not going back until September. And they're not going back until every child going in has had a coronavirus test. Now, I know that there's such a thing as Stockholm Syndrome. I know that there's such a thing of people tugging their forelocks, bending their knees to their betters. But if your betters are not sending their kids to school until September, why are you lining up to send yours back to school in June? And what about those Labour politicians? David Blunkett, the man who signed the treaty, which is going to send Julian Assange to the United States, but not Anne Sekoulis back to Britain to face trial for killing poor Harry Dunn. Lord Adonis, the postman guy, what's his name? Alan Johnson and Somebody called Barry Sherman, but you won't know who he is, though he's been in Parliament for well nigh 40 years. They've all lined up to kick the teachers, 
to kick the teachers' unions, calling them wreckers, irresponsible, anti-teaching, when all the teachers are saying is what every worker in the land should be saying. And all the teachers' union are saying is what every union in the land should be saying. We will not send our members back to work until you can guarantee us that they will not become sick and possibly die through working in a toxic workplace. After all, that is the law of the land. It is a criminal offense and potentially corporate manslaughter to allow your workers to go to their death instead of to go to their bench or their place in the work. We'll be talking uh, about coronavirus, of course, with Moats Medic, Dr. Ranjit Bra, whose videos with us continue to break all records because he's not only a razor sharp medical brain, he understands the politics behind all of this, including uh, the rush to sacrifice our children, but not theirs, to sacrifice our workers, but not them. And who can blame them for trying when they are aided and abetted by false consciousness and supine labor and trade union leaders? But I want to spend the next few minutes talking about the events in Venezuela. You see, it seemed comic opera at the time that a gang of mercenaries, including two US citizens, both claiming that they worked as security for Donald Trump, were captured by Venezuelan fishermen and women when they attempted to land on the coast of Venezuela and they confessed uh, that their purpose was to secure the airport so that the kidnapping of the president of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, could be carried out and he could be safely flown out of the country into the hands of the gringos, into the hands of Donald J. Trump. That seemed ridiculous. It seemed, as I say, like the plot of a bad soap opera. But now we've learned many other things about Venezuela and about Julian Assange. And both of those connect directly to the same intelligence agency, the CIA. We now know that the British government and secret state, whose names are redacted, took part in a discussion in London, in your foreign office, paid for by you, to gain illicit access to contracts worth billions of pounds to rebuild Venezuela once we had succeeded in knocking it down and destroying it. Now, I long ago ceased to hope for diplomacy from the diplomats of the British Foreign Office. But such a brazenly criminal, illegal conspiracy taking place in our Foreign Office almost took my breath away. But what did take my breath away was the revelation in Spanish court documents revealed by the wonderful Grey Zone project and the peerless Max Blumenthal is that the CIA, through Sheldon Adelson, the casino boss, of the Sands Casino in Las Vegas. Bear with me, I know it sounds like I'm making this up. Adelson's Sands Casino 
were the secret employers of the security company also being paid by the government of Ecuador to guard Julian Assange and the embassy of Ecuador in London. Instead of guarding Assange, instead of guarding the embassy, this CIA front company was garnering every piece of information that they could possibly get, including the feces from the dirty nappies of the son of Julian Assange and sending it to Mr. Adelson's security team in the Sands Casino, where after it was handed to the United States government. Now, the feces is one thing. Much dirtier is that this company secretly recorded every conversation between Julian Assange and his lawyers about the case being brought against him by the United States government. And the recordings illegally obtained were flown every month to the United States of America and into the hands of the government now seeking Julian Assange's extradition. Now, I'm not a QC, I'm not even a lawyer, uh, but I was a legislator for almost 30 years. And this I can say to you without any fear of contradiction. These facts alone would ensure that these extradition proceedings be thrown out of court with contempt, with laughter. There is no judge anywhere in the civilized world who would tolerate for one minute a case proceeding when the people bringing the case have already illegally obtained the privileged client, lawyer, confidential discussions between the person being pursued and his legal team. And yet, Assange is still languishing in Britain's Guantanamo Bay, and the United States are still seeking his extradition. And the British judge, I say, in very large inverted commas, doesn't give a damn about any of this. Which leads me uh, to conclude that if Assange is extradited to face 175 years in an American dungeon for publishing documents, then there is no law in Britain. Then Britain has ceased to be a member of the civilized world. That Britain is no longer a democracy and that journalism, broadcasting, freedom of speech has been murdered in plain sight. I'll be here until 10 o'clock. I hope to have the pleasure of your company. Radio Sputnik. every Tuesday to Loud and Clear for a regular segment called False Profits, a weekly look at Wall Street and corporate capitalism, where we talk about the big economic issues of the week from the point of view of working people, the poor, and the U.S. position in the global economy. Join us this Tuesday and every Tuesday with financial policy analyst Daniel Sankey right here on Radio Sputnik. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. We are talking 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You are listening. We give you the most essential out of the endless information space. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. 
Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We give you the most essential information out there. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. A big thanks to my friend Ian Puddock for this uh, hand sanitizer as supplied to the Ministry of Defence. I hope I haven't given away any secrets there, Ian. I'm sure the Ministry of Defence is delighted to be sharing hand sanitizer with me, as I am delighted to welcome my first guest of the evening. The first time I saw and heard Rachel Blevins, a young American woman on RT America with whom I work, I knew she was going to be a big star. I just didn't know it would be here in Britain that she'd become an even bigger star than she is in America. She is journalist, broadcaster, and all-round commentator, Rachel Blevins. Rachel, welcome back to the show. Let's start, if we can, uh, with your coronavirus situation. Uh, it's a truism, it's long ceased to be debatable, uh, that the United States has handled this the worst in the world, has the worst outcomes in the world. That must be curtains, then, for Donald Trump's re-election, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, George, for having me back. And it really has been a massive topic that is going to define the 2020 election based on Donald Trump's response. And there has been a lot to be desired there. You know, right now, not only do we have nearly 90,000 deaths and 1.5 million confirmed cases of the coronavirus, but at the same time, we also have more than 36 million Americans who are out of work, which is the largest loss of jobs in U.S history. And on top of that, nearly half of those Americans who have applied for unemployment insurance either haven't received their benefits yet or have been denied. And on top of that, we also have 20 million Americans who still have not received their initial stimulus check for just $1,200 from the government. So not only do we have a lot of coronavirus cases and not only do we have a lot of Americans out of work, but we also have a lot of Americans who aren't benefiting at all from the government and anything it says it's trying to do to help relieve that pain. That sounds like a recipe for serious trouble in your country. Do you feel that? Absolutely. And I think it's something that we're just now seeing the effects right now, but it's likely going to continue and it's going to be a massive topic as we get closer and closer to that November election. And, you know, just right now we're having Americans who are, you know, you see a lot of protest on the streets and people going and protesting at their capitals. And a lot of that is because they're frustrated with the government's response and they don't have the trust in the government to think that they're going to do the best possible thing by initiating lockdowns and they want some other option there and they just don't have that trust built up and it doesn't look like it's something that's going to be repaired anytime soon. Now Nancy Pelosi resplendent in a $450 scarf uh, addressed the people on behalf of the Workers Party, the Democratic Party in the United States. Well they had to put someone up because Joe Biden uh, is missing in action and even if they found him nobody would understand what he was saying. That's Trump's only hope, isn't it? That the Democrats have put up someone even more stupid than him. Yes, just about. And you know, the last time we talked, we were wondering, how is Joe Biden going to be able to go through all of these campaign rallies and these debates? And arguably, he couldn't have asked for a better outcome than the one right now, where he literally gets to stay inside of his house and to, you know, get on Twitter, have these pre-recorded videos, that sort of thing, where it's all pre-recorded and he doesn't have to do much live. But at the same time, all Biden has to do is just to criticize what Trump has done. All he has to do is sit in his basement and say, oh, I would have been a better president. I would have made sure that we were more prepared or that there were more initiatives in place in order to take care of the American people. And people can guess as to whether that would be the case. But he certainly is one that is just doing the bare minimum here. It's quite obvious to me that either he's going to be pulled out before November or the expectation is uh, that his vice president will have to take over if he is elected 
uh, and probably in quite short order uh, because uh, he can't possibly be long for this political world. In which case, the focus on who is to be the vice president must be quite intense now. Who are the runners and riders? Absolutely. Well, we've seen a lot of talk about Stacey Abrams out of Georgia, and there seems to be this focus when it comes to the Democrats on making sure that they have a female vice president or a minority candidate to really be able to talk about those sectors of the population that Biden hasn't really appealed with. Now, on top of that, I would argue that, yes, they're going to put a lot of stock on the vice president. But at the same time, when you look at the fact that the Democratic Party chose to put up Biden instead of Bernie Sanders, it really makes you wonder whether they want to win this election at all or whether they're looking at the next four years and realizing that it may be easier to just have Donald Trump take it for four more years and sit back and criticize him until they have a candidate who's maybe along the lines of Biden when it comes to the principles. But better spoken and can carry out an actual speech. Uh, I saw a very controversial uh, tweet from Donald Trump Jr., uh, which focused on uh, the absolutely creepy behavior uh, of Joe Biden around small children, uh, after which I can certainly say I wouldn't let him anywhere near my children, uh, which is quite a thing to have to say about the putative president of the uh, biggest and most powerful country in the world. Uh, is this likely to damage him in conjunction with the really now quite well-known rape charge which is in the air against him? Yeah, well, you know, before Biden even decided that he was running, I honestly said I would be surprised if he ran based on all of those videos and pictures that are out there of his actions when he's simply around young girls and young women. It is absolutely creepy just to see that he would be okay doing that in public, let alone in private. Now, this is one of those things where, unfortunately, here in the United States, things are so politicized that if someone says, if they accuse Biden of rape or of sexual assault, a lot of times people who who are already in favor of him or people who consider themselves Democrats will say, well, what are the actual allegations there? Does this woman remember what happened? And they'll try to pick apart that story. Whereas people who are against him will say, oh yes, I absolutely believe her. And it seems that that is the climate where we're in, in US politics, where it's almost as if you can only criticize the person and believe those charges against them or believe even the photographic evidence, as long as it's not your guy and your party. Well, uh, I'm reminded of uh, the uh, scene in which Groucho Marx is caught by his wife in bed with his secretary. And he sits up straight and says, it never happened. And then he says, who are you going to believe, me or the evidence of your own eyes? And of course, we've all seen, we can all see dozens, scores of instances of frankly disqualifying behavior in the presence of young children uh, carried out by, by Joe Biden. Uh, what happened to all these pussy hats and liberals and me too types uh, and believe women types? All those who said that if a woman makes allegations, they have to be treated as if they were true. Aren't they all now backing Joe Biden? You know, there seem to be a number of people who are backing Joe Biden just because he's not Donald Trump. And that's something that we saw a lot of back in 2016, where it was the people who said, well, I don't want to vote for Hillary Clinton, so I'll vote for Trump. Or the people who said, I can't stand Trump, I don't want him to be president, so I'll vote for Hillary Clinton. But one of the things that we saw in 2016 was we saw the lowest voter turnout in 20 years here in the United States, because we had two of the most unpopular candidates of all time. And now what they've done is we still have Trump on the one side, but they've simply replaced Hillary Clinton with Joe Biden. And so I think there should be a lot of outrage in the Democratic Party for all of these people who say, wait a minute, this is supposed to be the party for women, for minorities, for all of these people who don't feel like they're represented by the Republicans. Why aren't we getting that representation? And of all people, why is Joe Biden our nominee? Now, finally, and I'm grateful for your time as always, Rachel, um, the Democrats really, really hate Russia. And the Republicans really, really hate China. Is that the kind of election we're going to get? The Democrats claiming that Trump is a Russian agent and Trump claiming that Biden is a Chinese agent? 
That definitely could be the outcome. You know, as far as the Democrats go, we're seeing new evidence come out about the case of Michael Flynn, Trump's former national security advisor, and everything that happened there. But I also think it's important to remember that the mainstream media here in the United States, CNN, Fox News, they were the ones that peddled the Russiagate theory for years with no evidence whatsoever. And the intelligence community didn't come in and try to dissuade them from doing that at all. And so we have to remember that when it comes to the intelligence community and when it comes to their leanings here, if they can get the American people to believe that any government from any other country was able to successfully influence an election, then they know that they have that card in their hand and it's one that they can pull out at any time whatsoever in the elections to come. So they're not saying anything about, okay, is it possible that Russia could influence our election even when we don't have evidence of that? And at the same time, when it comes to China, President Trump has to be careful where he's going with that because he's sitting there and he's throwing out tariffs here or more of a trade war there. And that is going to have a massive impact on the American people at a time when he could be pushing for getting information from China as to how to deal with the coronavirus, which is the biggest thing that we are all dealing with right now. Rachel Blevins from RT America, thanks very much for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Very good to see you again. Is it safe to let children return to school? A, yes. 36%, no, 64%. You can vote now on my Twitter feed, at George Galloway. 852 of you have voted uh, this far. Let me read some of the comments that are coming in. Adam says, schools are still open anyway. The school I work for is open to essential workers' children. Schools should open for people who now need to get back to work, but there should be no sanction if people prefer not to send their kids in. In my case, Adam, I'll send my children back to school when Eton, Harrow, and the rest go back. Stuart says, when the MPs are back in the House of Commons, perhaps I will think about sending my kids to school, but there should be no sanction. Uh, Sorry, Uh, I would, uh, until then, I'd rather have them safe at home with me. And Ian says, I voted no, but not because of COVID, but because what they teach our kids these days is garbage, and some of it is borderline child abuse. And June says the children will be fine. It's the teachers who will be taken poorly, having to deal with children who are infected. That's the issue. And Luke says they shouldn't be going back to school until the lockdown has completely ended. We can't even manage adults to adhere to social distancing. And Tracy said, whoever said, yes, I want your evidence that shows it's safe. You either don't have children or you are brainwashed fools. And a Twitter user says there's little evidence of transmission from kids. Why would that be? Why are kids able to pass on everything else but not the coronavirus? That doesn't even make sense. It's not like flu where they are super spreaders unless there are vulnerable adults in the same household, it's safe. Keep drinking the Kool-Aid, brother. And uh, on Twitter, Wildcat75 says, children, because they cannot vote and do not pay taxes, are the single most important yet powerless demographic in the modern industrialized world. There's not a more oppressed demographic, as far as I understand the world to be. Well, I I became a donor this week to something called WaterAid when I saw their ad uh, which which told me that 800 children every single day, every day, die from drinking dirty water. Just think about that. And Larry says, how does the government calculate the R number when they don't trace everyone who was infected or is infected with the virus? My son-in-law had the virus for 18 days, 14 in the house and four in hospital. Not once was he questioned about his line of work or his place of work. And Nigel says, to say it's just the elderly that's dying is monstrous. We've just celebrated the 75th anniversary of VE Day, yet it's that generation that has been sacrificed to COVID-19 in care homes. Hypocrisy of the government is breathtaking. And not just the government, Nigel. Matt says, 
Would air dropping disinfectant onto cities help to contain the virus? Here in Portugal, there are vans that go around spraying the streets with bleach. I thought of a more effective way of doing this. You could maybe carpet bomb water balloons filled with antiseptic. And James says, do you think that as the leader of our country, Boris Johnson should be addressing the country every day and answering questions from the public and news reporters? Instead, we get stupid pre-recorded messages and are lucky to see him addressing the country once a week. Instead, we get all the stooges and Hancock who gets on my wick. Well, if I was the Prime Minister, I would be at the pulpit every single day. And I wouldn't leave it until all the questions had been properly answered. Eve in Idaho is on line one. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, Eve. Hello, Josh. Thank you for having me. I wanted to, uh, to make a comment on... Um on um, the election and about the third party. Uh, my first point is, when do you know that we are ready for a third party? And I think I got the answer. You get the, the answer is, you know we are ready when regardless of their platform, you know you would vote for them. And I want to give you um, uh, the illustration is that I know... Uh, Many people in this country, conservatives and, and, and uh, progressives, the conservatives, they don't want too many social programs. They don't want to give money to the, to the disadvantaged. And the progressives, they would like more of those. But I don't know anybody who wants public money to be given to the wealthiest people in the country. This is essentially what has happened for 20 years, 30 years, they are bailed out every 10 years for a reason or another. And the money is printed at the Federal Reserve and is thrown into the stock market. And this is the way we subsidize the richest people in the country. And I don't know anybody who would support that. And the third party should be based on those obvious facts. Then yeah, we can uh, because the, uh, the two cheeks of the same backside, the Republicans and the Democrats, are both absolutely culpable, including right now, uh, in that process of trickle up, uh, of the wealth trickling up to those who are already filthy rich. Now, I had high hopes that Jesse Ventura would run as a third party candidate. Are my hopes uh, misplaced on that eve? Is, uh, is, he, uh, is he, like Bernie Sanders, faltering? No, I think your, I think your hopes are justified. I, I'm waiting the same. And also, I want to, uh, to correct something the Democrats say all the time. And they say, well, you know, Joe Biden is not that great, but we have to, uh, he's not Donald Trump. That's why we should vote for, for him. This is absolutely false. You, because when it was Bernie Sanders, he was not Donald Trump, and the Democrats didn't support him at all. Exactly. Donald, well said. Yeah. Eve, I've got to but, press on. Thanks for a wonderful call, as usual. Michael is in Minneapolis. Let's hear from him. Michael. Hey, how you doing today, George? All good. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, so I, progressives in America were in a kind of a tough spot, and... Uh, you know, you've got Nancy Pelosi in the leadership. They've refused to consider their about four, three and a half, four stimulus bills we've done so far. They refuse. He refuses to consider uh, UBI, emergency UBI, rent or mortgage forgiveness. He won't expand Medicare. Just is not getting on board with anything that we're demanding or even considering it. And then you've got the progressives in the party, your AOCs and Bernies and and Rashida Tlaib getting shunted onto these task forces, which are just a farce talking about, you know, the climate or whatever. As Jimmy, as, as, as Jimmy Dore says, I prefer the old fashioned term, window dressing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, exact, you're exactly right. But they're not, you know, they're not really going to consider a Green New Deal or anything. And then on the other hand, after, you know, essentially stealing the nomination from Bernie Sanders, they're putting up Joe Biden, 
who is the most conservative right wing Democrat, would be the most right wing Democratic nominee since Al Smith in 1928. And that man was a literal fascist. <laughs> so I guess what my question, George, is where do we go from here? You've got to go third party, Michael. You can't go on like this. If you keep voting for the lesser of two evils, even though in the case of Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden, that's questionable whether they are the lesser of two evils, you're guaranteeing that evil will win every time. You need a party of the working class in America. And that must start sometime, and I can think of no better time for it to start than now. I absolutely agree with you. And that's why, you know, to your earlier comment from the previous caller, it's disappointing that uh, Jesse Ventura has decided not to run. Because I'm not sure. Be Do you think he's finally done. closed the door on it, Michael? The last thing I saw uh, was a, just a trifle enigmatic. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the last statement I saw he made was that he wasn't going to run, but that was about a week and a half ago. So it's mm -hmm. possible that maybe mm -hmm. he's changed his mind since then. I'm just I'm starting to think that electoral politics is never going to get it done. And that if we don't do a general strike, we're not going to have a chance. Yeah, but you're, like, not, you're, not, you're not going to get that, Michael. Uh, these things are a process, not an event. Uh, and, sure. uh, and therefore, the process needs to start. And it's got to start on the democratic level as well as on the industrial level, the community organization level, and so on. Mm -hmm. Michael, great call. Thanks very much for it. I must press on, though. Uh, this week, my RT short was on the subject of Brexit because I know you think it was all a done deal, but believe it or not, some of the most powerful people in Britain are still trying to cheat us out of Brexit. Take a look at this. Britain needs to be out of the European Union just as quickly as we possibly can, even if that means no deal. Even Yanis Varoufakis, who campaigned against Brexit, has advised us that such is the parlous condition of the European Union that we need to get out, deal or no deal. Though, in my view, the current disaster unfolding on the European mainland is such that we're much more likely to get a deal to our liking than we ever have before. COVID-19 has devastated the pretensions of the European Union to be an all-for-one and one-for-all club in which the devil is not allowed to take the hindmost. In fact, the richest, most powerful countries in the European Union abandon those at the core of the periphery, like Italy, like Greece and others, just as soon as the proverbial hit the fan. The rich countries, Germany in particular, were determined right from the start that they would not be picking up the bill for the problems on what they contemptuously call the periphery. By periphery, they mean huge countries like Italy, which was one of the most grievously damaged and earliest hit of coronavirus-19. The European Union, you'll recall, sent a man from Brussels right at the start of the crisis, not with aid and assistance, but with a fine a fine on the Italian government for illegally subsidizing their Sardinian tourism industry. Countries like Italy and Greece have appealed for euro bonds for the European Union to fund on a per capita basis, on a fair basis, the getting back to work and keeping the public safe efforts of their governments. This was rejected out of hand. Just like in Britain and the United States, the only interests in the minds of those who rule the European Union are the interests of the already rich and powerful. And they are determined that whatever else happens in the Eurozone, none of the neoliberal austerity politics of the last decade and more are going to be changed just because there are people suffering. There's another reason why Britain needs to be out of the European Union, and it's that if we're not out, we'll be forced to shoulder 
a considerable part of their bill for reconstruction on top of the bill for the reconstruction of our own country. And there's a third reason. Britain needs to be free when this devastation finally clears to reshape and remodel our own economy and our own country untrammeled by the chains of the European Union. We need to be able to nationalize industries. We need to be able to prefer the products and services of our own companies and businesses and industries. We need to be able to chart an independent course out of this morass. If we are chained to a fading, failing collection of economies that have been completely ruined by the coronavirus 19, we need to be able to do it as a free and independent country. It's true that the British government has been amongst the worst in the world. And I'm not saying that being free of the European Union necessarily of itself means that we can do better. But it is a necessary, if insufficient, condition to do so. Boris Johnson, in my opinion, has the skids underneath him. I feel that the Conservative Party must now be actively contemplating ditching the pilot. The Tories don't have anyone else, really, to run the country. That's why the mainstream media are so happy that they've got a safe pair of hands by the name of Sir Keir Starmer. I say a plague on both their houses, if you'll forgive the unfortunate pun. I say Britain deserves better than this. The last time we faced an existential challenge like this, Chamberlain was ditched, but then there was a Winston Churchill waiting in the wings. There are no Winston Churchills in today's House of Commons. We have to do better than this. But when it comes to Brexit, here's where I stand. We have to be all out by Hogmanay, deal or no deal. Have something to say? Do you disagree with George? Then call us now and give us your view. Vote now on my Twitter feed. 989 of you have voted thus far. Is it safe to let children return to schools? A yes, 36%. B no, 64%. That's the state schools, of course. On the 1st of June, of course. And not the private schools. Uh, they're not reopening until September, and only then uh, with a coronavirus test. If that doesn't tell you how you should be voting, really, you're a hopeless cause. Let's hear from Dave in Staffordshire on line one. Go ahead, Dave. Hello, da uh, hello there. It's very, uh, it's a great pleasure to speak to you, uh, George. You are indeed the professor. Thank you. And you consider me as one of your uh, long-term students. Thank you, sir. Um, I'd just like to take your view on the... The protests that have gone on in London. Now, I'm a left-leaning gentleman. If I lent any more to the left, I'd fall over. <laughs> and I'll happily join the front line in any protest going um, anti-establishment. Now, what I don't understand is what, the, what these protests are all about. Um, they, as far as I'm concerned, the, um, the lockdown, they're, they're concluding it far too swiftly. Yet there are hundreds or possibly thousands of people out in the streets um, protesting against uh, what's going on. What's your take on this, George? Thank you, Dave, for that very smart call. I think uh, it was hundreds and not thousands. Uh, something like 86% of the British people surveyed do not want the lockdown to end. The problem is that the clack uh, of the minority voices uh, contains a lot of people with typewriters a lot of people with megaphones, and a lot of people uh, who are ready to take to the streets, just like we saw in the United States. In fact, uh, if we had guns in this country, many of those at Hyde Park yesterday would have been bearing them. They are aping the survivalist, uh, libertarian uh, trend in the United States of America. I must say how sad, pathetic, actually looked and sounded uh, Mr. Piers Corbyn uh, at that uh, protest, and he was, of course, arrested. Mr. Corbyn encapsulated uh, the 
uh, slogan of these people. That number one, the coronavirus is not a pandemic, even though a pandemic means uh, that an epidemic has spread throughout the world, something which is literally undeniably true. And secondly, he said, uh, they have locked you down so they can control you. Now, this is the most absurd thing of all. First of all, who's the they in this picture? Is it capitalism? Is it the billionaire class who are bleating on the front page of the Sunday Times this morning about the tens, scores of billions of pounds they have lost? through the lockdown? Is it the business class that are pushing the government to end the lockdown and get their workers back to work to make them profits and to stave off the collapse of their company? Who are the they? If it's not the billionaires, if it's not the business class, who is it? Is it the deep state? which exists to defend the prevailing orthodoxy, to, pre to defend the system that the business class and the billionaires represent? Well, that would be odd, wouldn't it? So who is it that they have in mind? Well, in the case of uh, David Icke, it's some kind of cult, some kind of illuminati. And you don't have to look hard under the bushes to see that they are referring to uh, the Jews. It is just about the most repugnant social formation of any that I have ever seen manifesting itself on the streets of Britain. And irony of ironies, a significant number of them were wearing face masks medical face masks to protect against a virus which they claim is a hoax. You couldn't make it up. Dave, thanks for the call. Bruce is in Derby. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, Bruce. Hello, George. I'm pleased to speak to you. Now, I'm so old, Bruce, that when I saw the words Bruce and Derby, I thought of Bruce Rioch. Do you remember him? No, I don't. I'm... I'm Bruce Thorburn. Okay. And, um, Bruce was the captain of Derby and the captain of Scotland. Very, very fine player. Go ahead. Um, what I was going to say, obviously I'm a fan of yours, been a fan of yours for years, and Tony Benn as well. God rest his uh, soul. But, but what I want to talk about is um, the, the lie that is being told to the nation. The Conservative Party are pretending that they created a fund to look after us all and that they are our saviours. But I can, talk, I can tell you a fact which is happening to me and I expect it's happening to thousands of other agency workers as well. I was at work on a Tuesday morning and I got a text from UK.gov telling me from Boris Johnson that I should stay at home and save lives. And I showed you, that, and it wasn't like a spam email, it was a message sent to my private phone. So I showed it to my production manager, and she asked me, do you have any underlying health issues? I said, well, I've got high blood pressure and asthma. She said, you should go home. So I went home. Then I phoned my employer, my agency. They sent me a link so I had to go onto a website and download a form, fill it out, and send it in. So I, I did that, sent it in, heard nothing, five weeks go by, no wages, no income, nothing coming in. I can't sign on because I've still got a job. I've been told not to go to work, but this furlough program that we're all supposed to get, it's not happening for me. I contact my employer, and they said, oh, we're, we're all working from home. So um, they sent me a new link. But the new link, the website changed. Now the new link said it was for people suffering from coronavirus or who had coronavirus symptoms, which didn't apply to me. So 
here I am, like thousands of others who've been told to stay at home. We've got no work, no job to go back to. We can't sign on. We've got no money coming in. But the Tories are still pretending they're looking after us. That's a very, very powerful call, uh, Bruce. Um, the only advice I can give you, uh, and you may already have done it, you must urgently contact your member of parliament and Which say... Chris Williamson. Well, unfortunately, it's not now. Uh, and it's a Conservative MP instead. Uh, what, in Derby? Yeah. Chris Williamson got expelled and uh, he didn't get elected when he stood as an independent. Well, and the Labour... But the, internet, the internet's not up to date because I, I recently looked up who my MP was. Well, I wish your MP was, was Chris, Chris Williamson, Williamson. Uh, but alas, it's not any longer. But you need to contact urgently. I'll give you the number. If you phone tomorrow... <laughs> George, George, George. I'm giving you the number. Me, I'm giving you his ask number. you to call up a Tory MP, I'm no, wasting my no, time. No, you're not. Uh, if you say that... Listen, this, I've got something say, else I want to ask you, mate. Yeah, I'm going to give you this um, number. This is important. 0207-219-3000. And ask to speak to the Member of Parliament for Derby. And say that you were advised on national, international radio last night to do it. Now, your last point. Well, my last point was, um, well, there was two points as well. Uh, two points. One of them was, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to break a spoiler, so I'm not going to do that. But um, one of your recent shows, you were talking about a brilliant Penguin classic called uh, The Ragged Trouser Philanthropist. Yeah. And I read that, and I was really happy to see what happened to the guy who ended up with a blanket. Mm hmm And the second point was, you don't advertise yourselves on this show for the Workers' Party of Great Britain. No. Now, I'm already a subscriber of yours, but I'd love to join your new party. So where in Derby can I find that information? Do you have a Derby branch? Uh, well, look, I, I, I've taken a self-denying ordinance uh, just for ethical reasons, no legal reasons, uh, on this. So the best thing I can advise you to do is to contact the Workers' Party of Britain at their website, which is workerspartybritain.org. Thanks very much, uh, Bruce, for a most uh, cogent and powerful call. Is it safe to let children return to schools? A, yes, still 36%, B, no, 64%. I'd like to ask the 36% why they think it's safe to let our children back to school when the parents and staff at Eton and Harrow have already decided that it is not safe for their children to return to school. Why do you think that is, Mr. and Mrs. 36%? Does that not trouble you somewhat? Because if it doesn't, well, it really, really should. Yitz says schools are breeding grounds for germs. Bertie says absolute disgrace. Get them back to school. Lockdown kills, says Bertie in Ward 5. And Barry says... COVID-19 is not as serious as it's made out. The truth is in the numbers. The healthy under 60s have a very low probability of serious effects. <laughs> Hard luck call you unhealthy over 60s out there. Are there many of you? The case fatality rates have been ramped up. Untrue. They've been suppressed. And the fact that doctors are writing COVID on death certificates when it is only incidental to the main cause of death. Equally untrue, Barry. As a matter of fact, the government has done everything to suppress the number of COVID-19 deaths. And Chewy says, my uncle fell and was taken to Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. A young guy with coronavirus in the bed next to him infected him. Two days later, he died. And Joe says, maybe you can answer this. What a fantastic effort from the public to raise money for the NHS and care workers. My question is, does anyone know where it's all gone? 
Who has had it? And how is it being spent? I know people who work in these sectors and they don't know. There must be millions in the pot, but where is it? I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll ask Dr. Ranjit at the third hour, our Moats medic, if he knows the answer to those questions. But right now, it's news with the wonderful Jamie Lowe. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Tune in every Tuesday to Loud and Clear for a regular segment called False Profits, a weekly look at Wall Street and corporate capitalism, where we talk about the big economic issues of the week from the point of view of working people, the poor, and the U.S. position in the global economy. Join us this Tuesday and every Tuesday with financial policy analyst Daniel Sankey right here on Radio Sputnik. It's time to double down with Max and Stacy. Yeah, double down. We're talking markets, finance, business, economics, ka-ching, bling, just about everything money-related on Sputnik. It's called Double Down. We're asking, are dead cats bouncing or have fundamentals changed? That's this week on Double Down. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Radio Sputnik News. The death toll in Spain from coronavirus has dropped to below 100 for the first time since the outbreak began. However, the number of confirmed cases of coronavirus in Brazil has now surpassed that of both Spain and Italy. It means that the outbreak in Brazil is the fourth largest in the world after the country's health ministry registered 14,919 new confirmed cases in 24 hours, taking the total to 233,142 behind the United States, Russia and the UK. Brazil has done just a fraction of the testing for COVID-19 seen in the other three countries and the figures will now pile pressure on the president who lost his second health minister in a month. He has defied health experts and called for widespread use of drugs which haven't been proven to be effective against the virus. The 65-year-old right-wing leader has publicly attacked state governors in his country who have introduced quarantine measures to combat the spread, including the closure of schools, shops and restaurants. British Cabinet Minister Michael Gove has insisted England schools are safe to reopen but acknowledged that the risk can never be eliminated. He said the key was to make schools safe with smaller classes and staggered arrivals. The UK government has set out plans to begin a phase reopening of primary schools in England from next month. However, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are not following and are still keeping strict social distancing in place. Measures in England have been slightly relaxed to allow anyone who cannot do their job at home to go back into work when it's safe to do so. Labour's Angela Rayner is urging the UK government to publish the scientific advice guiding the plan to reopen the schools. She said that if the government could ensure that track and tracing was properly in place, that would reassure parents. Teaching unions are being backed by the British Medical Association and have raised concerns about safety. Former Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn's brother Piers was among 19 people arrested at an anti-lockdown demonstration in London's Hyde Park. Hundreds of people gathered to object to their rights of free speech and movement being curtailed along with some holding several placards and banners including slogans like freedom over fear. India is extending its lockdown for another two weeks as it attempts to curb the spread of coronavirus. The country went into lockdown on the 24th of March and schools, public transport and most businesses have been shut since. India recorded 2,896 deaths and it has more than 90,000 confirmed coronavirus cases and 53,946 active infection. It's the fourth time that the federal government has extended the world's largest lockdown covering 1.3 billion people. Science fiction and fantasy author Neil Gaiman has admitted to breaking Scotland's lockdown rules by travelling 11,000 miles from New Zealand to his holiday home on Sky. The Good Omens and American Gods writer left his wife and son in Auckland so he could isolate at his island retreat. He wrote on his online blog that he was now in rural lockdown on his own. Gaiman has since been criticised for endangering local people. China's ambassador to Israel, Du Wei, has been found dead in his apartment north of Tel Aviv. The 57-year-old was only a 
appointed ambassador in February, having previously served as envoy to Ukraine. The ambassador was married and had a son, but his family had still to join him in Israel. Meanwhile, Israel has sworn in a unity government after the longest political crisis in the country's history and amid the coronavirus pandemic. Under a power-sharing deal agreed in April, right-wing PM Benjamin Netanyahu will serve for another 18 months. His centrist rival, Benny Gantz, will serve as deputy PM before taking over. The two politicians have agreed to press ahead with a controversial plan to annex part of the occupied West Bank area as early as the 1st of July. Palestinian leaders reject the legitimacy of the move. And finally, new details have been released about encounters between U.S. Navy aircraft and unidentified aerial phenomena after the Pentagon declassified three videos. Hazard reports from the Navy Safety Center, first published by the website Drive, reveal an incident where a pilot encountered an unknown aircraft, which was approximately the size of a suitcase and silver in color. During the encounter, a Navy jet passed within 1,000 feet of the object but could not work out the identity of the craft. The pilot attempted to regain visual contact but was unable to. In one video, a dark circular object is seen flying in front of a jet while another shows a small object speeding over land. The final video clip shows a circular object moving quickly before appearing to slow down. A voice in one of the videos can be heard saying there's a whole fleet of them. And that's the latest here on Sputnik News. I'm Jamie Lowe. listening to Radio Sputnik. Sputnik telling the untold Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway only on Sputnik Radio You're listening to and or are watching the mother of all talk shows along with hundreds of thousands of people across the world We need your calls we need your messages we need your response to this poll. Is it safe to let children return to schools? A, yes, 31%, down 5. B, no, 69%, up 5. You can vote now on my Twitter feed, at George Galloway. 1,248 of you have voted thus far. You've got just less than an hour to record your opinion on that question, which is going to become a very big issue indeed. Now, as I said earlier, it's been a pretty bad week for the US intelligence community. Uh, first of all, the fabricated case against uh, General Michael Flynn has fallen apart and the uh, US Justice Department has walked away from their previous prosecution of it in connection with the Russia Gate affair. I feel a personal link to this because just uh, a month, couple of months before he was arrested, I was sitting at the same dinner table as him in Moscow, uh, where he was an invited and paid speaker at the RT anniversary celebrations. Uh, the Russiagate mania then claimed uh, that he was somehow in Moscow as part of Donald Trump's Russian entanglements and that somehow he was betraying his country. Nothing could be more absurdly far from the truth. And so although I share nothing in common uh, with General Michael Flynn, nothing at all, I know because I've had a long talk with him, I think that he was grievously uh, the victim of an injustice. And so I'm very glad uh, that the deep state persecution of Flynn has now fallen apart. Uh, and then there was the revelation in the gray zone, I think just about the most significant of the new media outlets that are applying their trade today. And if you're not following them, you really, really must. The gray zone revealed, Max Blumenthal revealed, their star writer, uh, that the CIA were actually employing the people that the Ecuador government thought they were employing to guard their embassy and their most famous inhabitant in any embassy, anywhere ever in the world, namely Julian Assange. But in fact, this company, a Spanish company of private uh, investigators, security company, 
were working for the CIA, and not just that, but working for a man called Sheldon Adelson. He was the cutout. Uh, he's a larger-than-life casino owner in <laughs> Las Vegas. I'm not making this up. He's also, of course, Israel's number one man in America. He is the font of undreamt of sums of money given to people uh, who are supportive of Israel. And he's also the man who spends the money to take down people that are not sufficiently supportive of Israel. So the CIA took another hit. But the biggest hit is surely the Bay of Piglets attempt to invade Venezuela from the sea with a gang of idiots that were captured by the fishermen and women off the coast of Venezuela. Now, our next guest links, in a way, all of these stories because he is a journalist and contributor to the Grey Zone, the Canary, and of course our own Sputnik, and he's the editor of the interregnum.net. He's here, I hope, to speak to me now. Mohammed El Mazi, welcome very much to the mother of all talk shows. Let's start with the Venezuela fiasco. Uh, just bring the listeners and viewers who are not perhaps as up to date as you on this story with what happened. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you very much for having me, George, uh, on your show. Uh, yeah, so briefly, it's all very dogs of war for anybody who's aware of the reference. Essentially, a, a private mercenary force uh, apparently enlisted for the sum of $213 million, according to a contractor, $212.9 million, to capture, detain, or remove uh, Nicolas Maduro, as well as to secure uh, certain areas in the country on behalf of uh, self-appointed interim president and opposition figure uh, Juan Guaido, who's backed by the United States government and is also recognized by governments such as that of Britain. Um, this uh, mercenary force, uh, which had a few former U.S. Special Forces members, Green Berets, so that's, that's a branch of uh, the U.S. Army, so U.S. Army Special Forces, along with at least 60 military, police, National Guard defectors from the Venezuelan state over the years, uh, were all part of this uh, mission. At least, uh, at least eight were killed. I think it looks like far more now are known to have been killed. Uh, others captured. Uh, Goudreau, apparently, so Jordan Goudreau, who's the CEO of Silver Corp, this, this unit, or who's still in the United States, so he's safe, he's not uh, captured in Venezuela. He himself has, has uh, come out, said that this was, you know, that he was part of this. He hasn't denied it. Uh, we've seen passports of the Green Berets, uh, uh, as well as their ID cards belonging to Silver Corp that they apparently took with them to Venezuela. Um, and yeah, this is all in the context of incredibly crushing U.S. sanctions on the country of Venezuela that have been going on for years now. They began under Obama, but escalated much further under uh, that, uh, the administration of Donald Trump with the explicit goal of affecting regime change uh, and which have resulted in, uh, according to one estimate from the center of uh, uh, one report from the Center of Economic and Policy Research, a Washington, D.C. based uh, think tank has resulted in at least 40,000 excess deaths in Venezuela in one year alone, 2017 to 2018. Uh, so uh, when people think, on the one hand, yes, it's, it's, it seems like a complete fiasco, uh, which doesn't make them look good at all, doesn't make the, the United States government look good. On the other hand, this is within the wider context of continued attempts uh, for regime change and the overthrow of the government, the democratically elected government, which, which uh, uh, a whole host of international observers have said, you know, are free and fair for an electoral system, which Jimmy Carter himself has said, uh, described as being a model. Uh, uh, Forbes magazine did an investigation in 2013 and called Venezuela's electoral system a model for the world, notwithstanding statements that people have made since then. Uh, and yet from 2002, as you you may recall, when Hugo Chavez was president, um, to, to today, there have been countless now attempts to overthrow the government uh, that have been 
overtly and covertly backed by the United States government. And, yet and this, this is, uh, appears to be the latest. The United States is a country uh, that uh, claims uh, that uh, Russia interfered in its election in 2016 and has adopted uh, law after law uh, to preclude anyone seeking from abroad to be interfering in their politics. Yet this same country is expending hundreds of millions of dollars to employ hired killers to change the regime in someone else's country. Uh, yeah, it would appear so. I mean, they're claiming deniability. I don't know how plausible it is. Uh, because this contract that we've seen, which the Washington Post has now published on its site, there's two separate contracts. One which actually, uh, in part of it, uh, explicitly states that the mercenary force has authority under the contract to use uh, deadly force in quote unquote uh, high collateral damage areas um, to when they're targeting certain figures. But so the contract appears to be with Juan Guaido, who is the the person who's backed by Mike Pompeo, Donald Trump, uh, uh, Elliot Abrams and others. Uh, and yeah, and we were hearing things only a few days before this, this foiled plot from Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who said uh, that actually the momentum is building and, and their plans on the way to, to reopen the U.S. Embassy in Venezuela. Uh, also, there were tweets, not so cryptic tweets from regime change hawk John Bolton, who was until recently a member of the uh, Trump administration. Um, that seemed to suggest something was happening. Uh, and it's worth noting, and I'm sure that we'll discuss this in a moment, that uh, this contract was signed in the autumn of last year, autumn of 20, uh, August, October 2019, um, which is the same time period that uh, the British Foreign Office apparently opened up um, a secret unit uh, around the same time, which it started to liaise with the Venezuelan opposition, specifically members of the Venezuelan opposition who were linked to violent attempts to overthrow the democratically elected government of Nicolas Maduro. Yes, I will come back to that. But first, uh, if the United States itself as a state was not involved in this invasion and incursion into uh, Venezuela, why have the Trump administration said that if these two Green Berets are not released, uh, that the United States will come and get them, will come and rescue them, even though, uh, by any standards, uh, they are guilty of a serious crime? Uh, that's exactly right. And as I said, uh, however, how, whatever levels of deni denials that we've heard, given the fact that we were getting messaging from key government figures like Mike Pompeo, that something was coming up. So I think it was the 29th of April, Mike Pompeo had made statements that, that, I, that I mentioned uh, only moments ago, that we should expect something is coming and that the U.S. Embassy will be reopening Venezuela. It sort of lends itself uh, to to the idea that the U.S. government, the U.S. states, even if they weren't directing it from the start, were at least aware of it uh, and were supportive of it. And I should say that according to the best friend of uh, Jordan Goodrow, a former Special Forces man himself, who's not part of this operation as far as we know, he told um, Anya Parampel of the Grey Zone on her show when she spoke to him uh, via phone, uh, and I suggest, uh, recommend that people listen to that program, Red Lines on the Grey Zone, uh, where he had said that uh, Goodrow had told him that uh, there was a contact of the U.S. State Department that was aware of and supported uh, the, the contract. So even if the United States was using a sort of a cutout, if you like, uh, nonetheless, there are there is quite a lot of evidence, I think, uh, even well, if it's uh, quite, circumstantial. Well, quite, quite a lot of evidence in this case. Uh, but the, if you look at the book, the United States has done this in practically every continent uh, for uh, 75 years at least. Uh, so there's no reason to uh, disbelieve uh, the theory uh, that the United States uh, was up to its neck in this attempt. What is more surprising, at least to some of our viewers and listeners, will be that the British government uh, was involved in a secret plan with violent oppositionists seeking the violent overthrow 
of a recognized government, not by Britain, but recognized by the United Nations, and therefore covered by international law, uh, to get contracts for British companies to rebuild Venezuela before they've even destroyed it fully. That's right. That's actually a brilliant uh, expose by a colleague of mine from the Canary, John McAvoy. And I, I interviewed him uh, for Sputnik on the, his very piece, which uh, is the product of government documents that he obtained through a series of freedom of information requests. And in those documents, he discovered the existence of a previously unknown unit in the Foreign Office, uh, the British Foreign Office, called the Venezuela Reconstruction Unit. And as he points out, uh, before you can have reconstruction, you have to have a deconstruction or at least de uh, destruction. And that is, interestingly enough, the creation of this unit seems to come about at the exact same time that this contract is signed between uh, uh, Juan Guaido, the right-wing opposition figure, and uh, Silver Corp, the U.S.-based mercenary uh, security force behind this, uh, this failed uh, coup or incursion. So uh, uh, if you look at the, some of the documents are redacted, but according to the uh, information that we do know that he uncovered, John McAvoy uncovered, uh, former UK ambassador uh, to Venezuela and a longtime ambassador elsewhere was one of the key figures or is one of the key figures in this Venezuela reconstruction unit. And uh, as you say, they have been liaising covertly and secretly with uh, members of the right wing uh, opposition who are linked to calls for a uh, violent overthrow of their government, including links to you know, support for the United States in doing so, which I think here and in the United States, that would be known as treason, just flat out, right, uh, without mincing words that this, uh, this unit has mention of business interests that British businesses would have access to without going to specifics. Uh, but some of your viewers may be aware that Venezuela sits upon the largest uh, known oil reserves uh, on the planet, uh, although many, much of it is hard to get at. It's not the highest quality oil. It is nonetheless uh, incredibly large in terms of its reserves. Venezuela is one of the, if not the single largest supplier of oil to the United States. And that didn't stop under the, uh, under the current government. Mohamed al -Mazi, thank you very much indeed for bringing us up to speed on the dirty business with Venezuela. Thanks very much indeed for that. Is it safe to let children return to school? 1,321 of you have voted. Yes, 31. No, 69. You've got until nine o'clock to get your vote in on that. Let me take a quick break. Radio Sputnik. We call Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan the most disruptive radio show in America. It's a great show and we have a lot of fun. We come to you live from Washington, D.C. every Monday through Friday morning. What I like best is that we bring in experts from all over the world. From Barcelona, from Egypt, from Seoul, South Korea. From Newark, New Jersey. We try to bring people great guests, great calls from our listeners, and of course, stupid jokes. And we do it with two hosts that have very different viewpoints. Now, here's the thing, Garland. A lot of people would think you and I would just argue. I mean, I'm a Republican Trump supporter. And, of course, I am a progressive Democrat Bernie Sanders supporter. The surprising thing is how much we actually agree on. And you won't be surprised because you're going to find out just how much you agree and just how much you enjoy this show. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Now get your calls in. Uh, the British number, UK number, is 02077982255. And the US number is 001-757-744-4480. Or you can tweet us at George Galloway, at RTUK News. Now, this is the spot where I look back at the seven days in history which shaped or distorted our world, starting with a truly bizarre one. It was on this day in 1978 that Charlie Chaplin's stolen body was found. His body and coffin had been missing from the grave, which was robbed 11 days before. It was dug up 
from a field about a mile away from the chaplain home in Switzerland. Roman Wardas, a 24-year-old Pole, and Granchko Ganev, a 38-year-old Bulgarian, were convicted in December 1978 of stealing the coffin and trying to extort 400,000 pounds from Charlie Chaplin's family. Wardas was sentenced to four and a half years hard labor for masterminding the plot to ransom Chaplin's body. Earlier in 1960, the much anticipated Big Four summit in Paris failed before it even began. The issue was the US U-2 spy plane, which had been shot down by Russia over the country two weeks before, initially denied by the Americans. The American pilot, Gary Powers, who bailed out, was sentenced to 10 years in a Soviet prison in August 1960, but was exchanged for a Soviet spy in 1962. There were no further U-2 flights over the USSR as after the 1961 spy incident, satellites performed the same function. Spinning back several centuries, it was in 1291 on May the 18th that after 100 years of crusader control, Acre became the last Christian stronghold reconquered in Palestine. I'll be speaking about Palestine on Tuesday night, by the way, at 8 p.m. online on all platforms, uh, if you're interested in my take on that. More than five centuries later, on the same day, that's May the 18th, in 1804, Napoleon Bonaparte was proclaimed, rather proclaimed himself, Emperor of France by the French Senate, which was a rubber stamp assembly. In 1944, after six days of fighting, Polish troops finally entered the ruins of the ancient hill uh, monastery of Monte Cassino, which had been a symbol of German resistance since the beginning of the year. Both of my grandfathers fought in that battle of Monte Cassino under Montgomery in the 8th Army as part of the Highland Division. And both told me how horrific a battle Monte Cassino actually was. On the same day, uh, still the 18th of May, in 1972, the Nazi sympathizer, the Duke of Windsor, was not well enough to attend tea with Britain's Queen Elizabeth, her uncle, when she came to visit his home in Paris. The Queen with Prince Philip and Prince Charles was due to see him for the first time in five years and the first time in his own home. Ten days later, the Duke died. He had been suffering from throat cancer for some time. On the 19th of May in 1536, Anne Boleyn, the second wife of Henry VIII, was beheaded at the Tower of London on charges of adultery, incest and treason. And in 1974, the gaullist Valéry Giscard d'Estaing was elected president of France, defeating the socialist François Mitterrand. His main contribution was the formation of the European Council in 1974, a group of all heads of state of member countries that pushed forward a European monetary system in 1979. I wonder how that one's going. On the 20th of May, in 27, 1927, another Nazi sympathizer, Charles Lindbergh, took off from New York to cross the Atlantic for Paris aboard the Spirit of St. Louis on the first non-stop flight across the Atlantic. A day later, Lindbergh arrived. It was on that same day in 1932 that Amelia Earhart landed in Derry in the north of Ireland after flying for 17 hours from Newfoundland. It was the first solo transatlantic flight by a woman. In 1991, on that day, Rajiv Gandhi, the former Indian Prime Minister, was assassinated while campaigning for the Congress party when a powerful bomb hidden in a basket of flowers exploded, killing him instantly. It later emerged that a female Tamil Tiger suicide bomber had killed him. In 1987, Gandhi, then Prime Minister, had sent Indian peacekeeping forces to Sri Lanka. 
On May 22nd in 1981, the man known as the Yorkshire Ripper, the mass murderer Peter Sutcliffe, was sentenced to life imprisonment at the Old Bailey. He had been convicted of murdering 13 women. Sutcliffe was later diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and sent from Parkhurst Prison on the Isle of Wight to Broadmoor, secure mental hospital in Berkshire in 1983, where I think he still is. On May the 23rd in 1813, South American independence leader Simon Bolivar entered Merida, leading the invasion of Venezuela and was proclaimed El Liberador, the Liberator. In 1988, on the same day, the Good Friday Agreement, which brought peace of sorts to the north of Ireland, was ratified on both sides of the border in a referendum. That was a truly tumultuous seven days. That was the week. That was. Let's go back to the phone lines and talk to Brent in Southampton on schools. Go ahead, Brent. Yeah, hello there, George. Hi. Um, just on the subject of schools, I'm a supply teacher and I suppose I have a vested interest in schools reopening. But I guess also I have a vested interest in... Um, staying alive myself um yeah. you know the british medical association have advised schools remain shut the teaching unions um what i want to talk about in particular is ian austin has attacked the teaching unions for trying to represent their members and who perhaps don't want to uh, catch the virus and you know die i just want to know what you think about how someone like ian austin ever became a Labour MP, or to that matter, someone like him was ever allowed to even join the Labour Party? Uh, he's a wretched uh, individual and always has been, uh, but he wasn't just an MP. He was once a heartbeat away from Gordon Brown, the British Chancellor of the Exchequer, later uh, Prime Minister. I Ian Austin was as close as it's possible to be, decently, uh, to the top Labour leadership. He then spent uh, the whole of the tenure of Jeremy Corbyn as Labour leader uh, attempting politically to assassinate him. He lent himself to every smear, every slander. And then uh, in the days before uh, the last general election, he literally joined the Tories. He accepted a position from the Tory government he uh, paraded around the streets in front of the cameras uh, as a former Labour MP. He was still an MP at that time. Uh, it was uh, prior, immediately prior, uh, to the last election, uh, calling on people to vote for Boris Johnson. Uh, and uh, now he's attacking uh, the school teachers. Uh, but a wretch like him can be written off because he's part of Labour's past. But Alan Johnson isn't. Barry Sherman isn't. He's still a Labour MP. Lord Adonis, uh, only a year ago, uh, was at the top of the list of Euro fanatics standing for Labour in the European Parliament elections that should never have taken place, as we had already voted to leave. So uh, these people, and David Blunkett, He's still in the Labour Party. He's described in the papers as a Labour grandee. And of course, none of these people have been contradicted by any Labour frontbench spokesperson, and certainly not by the Labour leader, Sir Keir Landsman. Now, I mean, that's the, uh, the, the bigger scandal, Brent. Well, what I think is a bigger scandal is why Jeremy Corbyn did absolutely nothing about people like um, Ian Austin and some of the others that you mentioned. Um, he was sort of, he, you know, he never stood up for Ken Livingstone, for Chris Williamson and people like that, whilst he allowed people like um, Margaret Hodge and those sort of people to pretty much gave a free reign. Yes, well, I'm afraid there's no contradicting that, painful though it is to acknowledge it. That's the reality. Not only did he not do anything against these people, uh, he promoted some of them. Uh, he, he could have said, um, 
Lord Adonis, who has told Brexit voters that they should not vote Labour, uh, is not fit to be a Labour candidate. And I'm withdrawing uh, the Labour name from his candidature. He could have done that. He promoted Starmer and several others who had been prominent backstabbers and coup makers against him. Now, any history of this period will show uh, that uh, he therefore was a willing accomplice in his own downfall. And look where that leaves the working class in this country. Last word to you, Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, it would have been great to have had in this country a left-wing social democratic party, you know, championing the interests of, of working people. Sadly, that was not to be. I joined the Labour Party, actually, around about 2015, and all I seemed to notice people doing was ways of stopping Brexit, ways of le staying in an organisation that would have actually prevented a large part of Corbyn's programme from happening. I mean, that's the state the Labour Party's in. Bravo. Um, you Bravo. know, that's why I've now left Bravo. it, incidentally. And the, and the author of that plan was Sir Keir Starmer. And his most able lieutenant was John MacDonald, who is shortly to be lecturing the left on what they need to do in the future. You couldn't make it up, Brent. Thanks uh, very much for an excellent call. Is it safe to let children return to schools? A, yes, 30%. B, no, 70%. And uh, you can vote now, still, until 9 o'clock on my Twitter feed. Now, let me read some more of the comments that are coming in. Jack says, no, the schools should not go back. The R rate is not low enough. The death rate's far too high. We don't know enough about nascent problems such as the Kawasaki disease and the almost totally ignored post-viral issues, long-term health conditions, uh, which are being reported by recovered COVID-19 patients. And Lee says, any child that doesn't obey the rules should be sent home and maybe do it as a three-day week. So you get half the class sizes. But I wouldn't if I had kids. Well, by the grace of God, I've got lots of kids and I will not allow them to go back to school until Eton and Harrow have gone back, until it's safe for the children of our rulers to go back. That's not rocket science, really. And by the way, Lee, children in schools cannot be asked credibly to obey social distancing rules. I got a report uh, very recently uh, of children who had gone back, and you know that a lot of children of essential workers have still been going to school and brave teachers have still been trying to teach them. But the children are all hugging each other and playing in the playground because that's what children do. Children require adults to stop them getting into situations where they will be harmed. Let's talk to John in Pickering. Go ahead, John. Hey, George. Thank you for having me on. Welcome, sir. Um, yeah. Well, it's the exact point I want to talk to you about, the R rate. Um, I'm in the north of England, and Rydale, which is my constituency, is probably uh, what you consider to be quite an affluent area. However, 20 miles north, Middlesbrough isn't. Now, when you talk about compliance rates, when we were in lockdown, Rydale has a 90% compliance rate. Everyone stayed in. We're all good boys and girls. Middlesbrough had a 20% compliance rate. So we get to the R number. In London, it's gone down dramatically. Everyone seems to be doing pretty well. They've got the infection rate down. Boris now wants everyone go to go back to work and, and, you know, start the economy again. But in Middlesbrough and Hartlepool, the mayor of Hartlepool came out just yesterday and said, nobody should be going back to work. Our R rate is climbing. It's dangerous. So does anybody really care about the north of England or the northeast? The northern powerhouse, or as Dennis Skinner would say, the poor house, <laughs> that's how it feels like. It's true. People in the North East, oh, it's all right, yeah. We, the reason we have a 20% compliance rate there is because the people in the North East have lived in dangerous conditions for God knows how long. They don't really care. They're not that frightened. 
they live in small houses, a lot of them, and they live in poor conditions. And they live in, well, not real poverty, but they live in certainly more poverty than where I live, in Rydale. So there's hardly any wonder they've got a, a, a slightly low, dramatically low um, compliance rate, and now we've got a high R rate. So what do you think about that, George? Am well, I, right? I think, first of all, that that's the call of the night uh, so far, uh, brilliantly, succinctly summed up in every regard. Uh, what I do know is that the closer I get uh, to uh, people who are not in my household, the more likely I am to catch the coronavirus. Uh, the larger the number of people with whom I get close, the more likely I am to catch the coronavirus. And so for me, and I'm not Einstein, it's a no-brainer really. It's my job to protect myself, but more importantly, to protect my small children that depend on me uh, by staying away from people as much as I possibly can and staying away from large groups of people as much as I possibly can. Now, the R rate is, of course, the bull point. If you are infecting at least one other person, then the numbers are still climbing. If you are infecting fewer than one person, uh, then obviously things begin to reduce. Now, as this farce of an end to the lockdown has unfolded, with uh, people milling around close to each other uh, on public transport with no protection, not even for the staff that are operating the public transport. And going into works, I see the, uh, the car industry is starting tomorrow in the West Midlands, 2,000 people going back to work in a factory. Well, again, you don't need to be Einstein to surmise uh, that the R rate is going to rapidly increase. And then the pressure on the National Health Service, which we were told the lockdown had been introduced to obviate, uh, will dramatically be enhanced instead. And lastly, uh, John, any fool knoweth or ought to uh, that the second wave of the Spanish flu pandemic in the immediate post-World War I era killed far more people than the first wave had done. Even the third wave of it killed more people than the first wave had done. So for me, this is really not difficult. It's not difficult to work out, John. I'm surprised that there's anybody out there who hasn't worked it out. Last word to you. It's frightening. Well, I totally agree with you, but you see, in the Northeast, this isn't the second wave, it's actually the first wave because we were three weeks behind the infection rate that London had. So this is something that was always going to be catching up. And therefore, we're all going to be sent back to work when our R rate's climbing. What's going to happen? I'll tell you what, I don't think it'll end well for the North East. And when our infection rate does go high and people are dying and our hospitals are full, do you think we'll just, the government will just turn around and say, oh no, We've got a slight problem in the northeast in these industrialised areas where people are working two feet from one another. Do you think we'll shut it down? No, the one because it'll cost too much bloody money. That's why. So yeah, I, I do worry for the safety of these people that are going to be forced back to work. And yet, and yet, John, there's still 30% on my poll on my show think it's safe to let children return to school when children are well known to be. Uh, spreaders of all kinds of germs and bugs because they're running around at the closest possible quarters amongst uh, 20, 30, 50, 70 other kids all day and then they come yeah. home. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a recipe for disaster, there's no doubt. It is. But John, thanks. Uh, that, that Middlesbrough do have in their favour. They've got a wonderful hospital, James Cook, which I'm thankful for. My, my son was born just about four months ago, and he was born about 10 weeks premature, and they were superb. And I, I can't thank them enough for what they've done to my family. So God protect sure them. 
They're God protect them the and, and bless your Absolutely. bless your child, John. Thank you very much indeed. I've got to take a quick break. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Tune in every Thursday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for the regular segment called Veterans for Peace, where we focus on the contemporary issues of war and peace that affect veterans, their families, the country, and the world as a whole. Veterans for Peace President Jerry Condon joins the show every Thursday. Hear about this and more every Thursday right here on Radio Sputnik. We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway. The world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Okay, 1,500 people have voted. Still, yes, it's safe to let the children return to school. 30%. I wish they'd call. And B, no, 70%. You can vote now on my Twitter feed. And uh, Dave on Twitter says, if the pubs were open, they would be out in droves. I, I expect that that's true, actually. Alex says, here in Canada, the, clothes are, the schools are closed until September, and rightfully so. And uh, Twitter user says, so far, 20 people under the age of 20 have died from COVID-19. You're actually killing more children by enforcing lockdown. How? How? Conditions won't be diagnosed, lack of exercise and bad diet exacerbated. Cindy says, why would I send my child back out when adults are being told to stay at home? How do young people socially distance at the bus stops, in the shops before they even get to school? My child is precious, not a daily total. And Tony says, a five-year-old who was fit and healthy until a mild bout of COVID-19 caught at school developed Kawasaki inflammatory disease. More and more of these stories emerging. Don't send your children back to school. And Dave says, look at it this way. You can't replace your child if it is a mistake to open schools, no matter how much they apologize afterwards. Be safe. And on Facebook, Jenny says, the hospital staff in war-torn Yemen has better PPE than the UK. This has been calculated genocide from the government. And uh, comments on uh, social media generally in response to the poll, the R rate, no, we've got that one. Uh, Ahmed, uh, yeah, if it wasn't safe, says Ahmed, in March when we had few hundreds of active cases in our society, how can it be safe now when we've got over 200,000 active cases ready to explode into millions once you relax the lockdown? The government is openly trying to sacrifice a good portion of the population for profit. And Dave says, what else do you expect the kids to do? There is such a thing as an immune system, which has worked for most of us. Oh, well, too bad for the rest, Dave. Uh, do you want kids to be brain dead? Well, I definitely don't want them to be dead. Put it that way, Dave. Uh, Nadia says, uh, by the way, Dave says, this is driving us all mad. Quite clearly, Dave. Uh, Nadia says, it's so safe to send well children to school, we need to get back to normal, not any new normals. And Mike says, COVID-19 is not the problem. It's only a catalyst that exposes the real problem. Evil, incompetent, corrupt leadership. Any bump on the road exposes how our leadership is unable even to handle a small problem, much less a major catastrophe like this pandemic. And Lar says, I'm amazed that no one in the British government has resigned, me too, uh, over this disastrous handling of the crisis. It's my opinion that Johnson, some members of the government, and scientific advisors are responsible for many unnecessary deaths. Well, you, uh, Lar, me, and the British Medical Association, who presumably know what they're talking about. Here's a call from Australia in Melbourne. It's Jimmy on Julian Assange. Most welcome, Jimmy. Go ahead. Oh, good day, George. Look, um, just quickly on the uh, on the COVID crisis before I get to Assange, how come uh, say construction workers and other sort of uh, so people that are using their hands and are concerned about safety they wear PPE? So why can't the world just 
go on wearing gloves and clear glasses and, yeah, why can't it just function at the same time? You know what I mean? Well, even our bus drivers don't have a mask. That's, that's a mistake. You know, it's... Anyway, that's, that's what I think should be looked into with COVID, the fact that there isn't enough... People it's a bit yet. late now. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's too late for the right. PPE now. Uh, we, we're, we're, already, we're already yeah. months into the crisis. And even well, our doctors, kind of even our nurses don't have like. proper uh, PPE. Anyway, yeah. Jimmy, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. OK. No, that's all right, mate. Look, now, back with Assange. I just think, uh, look, I've written to my, uh, my local member... I've gone on rallies in, uh, in Melbourne CBD. And, look, I don't think it's got anything to do with the mainstream media not reporting on it. You know, the facts are that it's basically just corrupt uh, what, judges and the way that the, uh, well, the secret service were cut and hacked into, uh, into uh, the embassy. Mm. So the fact, you know, like how, how can... Uh, how can we honestly expect justice if we've got politicians and then politicians well, uh, aren't doing anything? Yeah, it's, I mean, of it's, course, it's, I take it's, your, uh, it's, I take your it's point, it's but one hoped uh, that judges were not quite as corrupt as politicians because you can't get much who, more corrupt judging than judges? politicians. Who's judging well, the quite, judges? Uh, well, we have several tiers. Uh, the current judge at the magistrate's court level uh, is uh, woefully pitifully, pathetically, short of the standard of any judge I have ever seen deal with any case, including, uh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, loitering with intent or littering in the streets. Mm. Uh, she is literally not yeah. fit to sit in judgment, even on miscreants such as that. Uh, but this will then well, be appealed. This will then be appealed uh, to a higher court and, if necessary, to a still higher court. And I have not given yeah, up it, hope that at the higher well, levels look, this is what I'm, of the I'm British judiciary, the we will get justice. So it's going to go through this, George. Why does it have to go through all these tiers if the evidence they've got is, has been obtained illegally or by well, unlawful I, means? That's exactly what I said. Uh, the case should have been thrown out immediately uh, with a peal yeah. of laughter. A peal of laughter. Mm. You mean you bugged the guy you're trying to extradite? So you know all of the discussions that he's had with his lawyer, which are legally protected and sacred. Get out of here with your extradition so how request. Judges, how do judges get to where they are? Do politicians nominate them like it is in the United States? How does it work? No, in, uh, no, it's not United like Kingdom? it's it's not like the United States. It's not as directly. Okay. It's not as directly so political. Like uh, but the, the the judicial <laughs> establishment. Uh, appoints each other and elevates uh, each other. Jimmy, thanks for staying up so late or getting up so early uh, to follow the show. I appreciate it very much. Brian is in Glasgow on the uh, uh, COVID-19. Go ahead, Brian. Hi, George. How are you? I'm good, by the grace of God. Thank you. Uh, Go ahead. Good. And before I start, ladies, first of all, free Julian Assange and any court official such as a judge has got to be, from my point of view, be committing malfeasance. And secondly, just as a person to person, no one ever says, and it should be commended that during uh, that dictatorship of Saddam Hussein, when he had British subjects as a human shield, you were the only guy that got on a plane and went in there, uh, possibly being a human shield yourself, and got them out. You should get a medal from the state for that. It's Thanks, a disgrace uh, the way they it's, twisted uh, that. It's kind of, your, almost it's kind you, of were a, you were an ass licker. They called you almost an ass licker when you were licking yeah. ass to get people from a mad man. Mm -hmm. Anyway, now, once I said that, uh, I did call last week and you sort of said silver hats. I did wrongly sort of say, use the phrase, so-called pandemic. That was wrong. Of course it's a pandemic. But here's my thing, George, and it's arithmetic. I look at the total number of deaths, and yes, they will be changed. And yes, it's it's a horrible, horrible thing. But the approach in the stands was based on a projected arithmetic, which was going to cause as much pain and suffering that no one could gauge because we had a terrible dilemma. But now the metrics for me, when I was first shot, they'd ask to uh, uh, isolate, and I agree with everybody, I agree, no one should go to school, certainly until they're screened, and even then there should be ongoing screening. But 
The first thing I did was go on to the uh, National Statistics site and look for the death rate for the year 2017 being the last one. And the total deaths was 616014. So roughly 50,000 deaths a month, which I just want to keep as an uninformed member of public as a metric. And so the figures today for COVID deaths are what? And what are the deaths that we can compare with non-COVID deaths overall? These are the questions I ask because... Mm. One of the things that's happening, especially in America, is arbitrage. We are literally making deals in the Senate to wipe out the middle class who are getting destroyed by this. And I think it's wrong to say that people are putting economy before the, uh, people's lives. Uh, there is that degree, absolutely, and billionaires are losing. But they're part of this arbitrage that's going on, George. There's a lot of things at play here. But my thing is, we should be balancing lockdown in a sophisticated way, which we can't because of the criticism you rightly say about government ill-prepared, even though we're paid taxes, to know what we should be prepared for. So, yes, it's a disgrace. It's capitalism that's worse. Uh, but this shutdown is uh, also destroying economies. And that's all I'm saying. But look at the figures, George. It's over 30,000. 30,000 per uh, month. No, uh, well, uh, OK, uh, Brian, thanks uh, for the tone and content of what you said. Uh, the actual death numbers uh, in Britain, as calculated by the ONS and as uh, predicted by the Financial Times, which broke the story about the uncounted carnage in the care homes. And when this is all over, I believe that some people should go to prison uh, for what happened in our care homes. In fact, it's laughable to call them care homes because care was the last thing that they received. And people were being turfed out of hospital into care homes, which had no PPE and no testing. And those people not only died themselves, but killed many others. The actual figure for death in Britain this year is 40% nearly, 39% to be precise, 39% higher than the average of the last five years. Now, you can imagine uh, that uh, the uh, excess death over the average is, uh, is attributable to something else. I prefer to take the doctors and the nurses' evidence uh, that it is attributable to COVID-19. We have by any standards, 39% is a gigantic increase on death in our community. And I am totally unmoved by people who say that it's mainly old people. Because I'm old-fashioned enough to believe the old people are worth exactly the same as middle-aged people and as young people are. The old people in the care homes are the very people that we celebrated last weekend on VE Day. And so to cavalierly imagine that their death is somehow less important is repugnant to me. Secondly, I am totally unmoved by those who say it's mainly those with underlying conditions because I believe that people with underlying conditions have as much right to life as anybody else. And anyone who institutes and prosecutes policy which will make those with underlying conditions or advanced age more likely to die is a killer. This is euthanasia and not voluntary. It's euthanasia, it is an attempt I think, deliberate attempt to cull our population through a hidden secret policy which was inadvertently revealed right at the beginning of the crisis. A policy of herd immunity. So that me, I'm not young by any means, but I feel young. I'm, by the grace of God, healthy. I get it, and I don't die from it but I give it to somebody else who has an underlying condition or who has advanced age and they die. Well, I will not go quietly into that good night. I spent 
nearly 30 years in Parliament, warning against the slippery slope to euthanasia already happening in our country long before COVID-19. I will not go quietly into that. Good night. Brian, thanks for the call. Let's get the news with Jamie Lowe. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Tune in every Tuesday to Loud and Clear for a regular segment called False Profits, a weekly look at Wall Street and corporate capitalism, where we talk about the big economic issues of the week from the point of view of working people, the poor, and the U.S. position in the global economy. Join us this Tuesday and every Tuesday with financial policy analyst Daniel Sankey right here on Radio Sputnik. It's time to double down with Max and Stacy. Yeah, double down. We're talking markets, finance, business, economics, ka-ching, bling, just about everything money-related on Sputnik. It's called Double Down. We're asking, are dead cats bouncing or have fundamentals changed? That's this week on Double Down. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Radio Sputnik News. The death toll in Spain from coronavirus has dropped to below 100 for the first time since the outbreak began. However, the number of confirmed cases of coronavirus in Brazil has now surpassed that of both Spain and Italy. It means that the outbreak in Brazil is the fourth largest in the world after the country's health ministry registered 14,919 new confirmed cases in 24 hours, taking the total to 233,142 behind the United States, Russia and the UK. Brazil has done just a fraction of the testing for COVID-19 seen in the other three countries and the figures will now pile pressure on the president who lost his second health minister in a month. He has defied health experts and called for widespread use of drugs which haven't been proven to be effective against the virus. The 65-year-old right-wing leader has publicly attacked state governors in his country who have introduced quarantine measures to combat the spread, including the closure of schools, shops and restaurants. British Cabinet Minister Michael Gove has insisted England schools are safe to reopen but acknowledged that the risk can never be eliminated. He said the key was to make schools safe with smaller classes and staggered arrivals. The UK government has set out plans to begin a phase reopening of primary schools in England from next month. However, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are not following and are still keeping strict social distancing in place. Measures in England have been slightly relaxed to allow anyone who cannot do their job at home to go back into work when it's safe to do so. Labour's Angela Rayner is urging the UK government to publish the scientific advice guiding the plan to reopen the schools. She said that if the government could ensure that track and tracing was properly in place, that would reassure parents. Teaching unions are being backed by the British Medical Association and have raised concerns about safety. Former Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn's brother Piers was among 19 people arrested at an anti-lockdown demonstration in London's Hyde Park. Hundreds of people gathered to object to their rights of free speech and movement being curtailed along with some holding several placards and banners including slogans like freedom over fear. India is extending its lockdown for another two weeks as it attempts to curb the spread of coronavirus. The country went into lockdown on the 24th of March and schools, public transport and most businesses have been shut since. India recorded 2,896 deaths and it has more than 90,000 confirmed coronavirus cases and 53,946 active infection. It's the fourth time that the federal government has extended the world's largest lockdown covering 1.3 billion people. Science fiction and fantasy author Neil Gaiman has admitted to breaking Scotland's lockdown rules by travelling 11,000 miles from New Zealand to his holiday home on Sky. The Good Omens, an American gods writer, left his wife and son in Auckland so he could isolate at his island retreat. 
He wrote on his online blog that he was now in rural lockdown on his own. Gaiman has since been criticised for endangering local people. China's ambassador to Israel, Du Wei, has been found dead in his apartment north of Tel Aviv. The 57-year-old was only appointed ambassador in February, having previously served as envoy to Ukraine. The ambassador was married and had a son, but his family had still to join him in Israel. Meanwhile, Israel has sworn in a unity government after the longest political crisis in the country's history and amid the coronavirus pandemic. Under a power-sharing deal agreed in April, right-wing PM Benjamin Netanyahu will serve for another 18 months. His centrist rival, Benny Gantz, will serve as deputy PM before taking over. The two politicians have agreed to press ahead with a controversial plan to annex part of the occupied West Bank area as early as the 1st of July. Palestinian leaders reject the legitimacy of the move. And finally, new details have been released about encounters between US Navy aircraft and unidentified aerial phenomena after the Pentagon declassified three videos. Hazard reports from the Navy Safety Center, first published by the website Drive, reveal an incident where a pilot encountered an unknown aircraft which was approximately the size of a suitcase and silver in color. During the encounter, a Navy jet passed within 1,000 feet of the object but could not work out the identity of the craft. The pilot attempted to regain visual contact but was unable to. In one video, a dark circular object is seen flying in front of a jet while another shows a small object speeding over land. The final video clip shows a circular object moving quickly before appearing to slow down. A voice in one of the videos can be heard saying there's a whole fleet of them. And that's the latest here on Sputnik News. I'm Jamie Lowe. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. Well, that flying saucer looked tasty, didn't it? The size of a suitcase that I hear him say. And what happened to China's man in Tel Aviv? How intriguing that story is. Uh, Mike Pompeo goes to Israel to warn Israel about increasing its cooperation with China. Uh, the Chinese ambassador to Israel denounces him, and two days later he's found dead. Mm. Is it safe to let children return to school? That poll is closed now. 1,658 people voted. A, yes, 31%. B, no, 69%. So more than two to one say it is not safe to let children return to school. But almost a third uh, did think it was safe uh, to let children back to school. Well, you can include me out uh, in that. Now, uh, Dr. Ranjit Bra has been with us right throughout this crisis. His fame has rightly grown uh, because of the super sharp analysis that he's provided listeners and viewers uh, to the mother of all talk shows over what now seems like months. I can hardly imagine life without Dr. Ranjit. And he joins me now, I hope. Yes, indeed. Uh, Dr. Ranjit, can you deal first with a question that was raised earlier? Uh, Colonel Tom Moore, in his epic walking feat, raised 31 million pounds for what was at first described as NHS charities, although that began to change a little, I noticed, and the formulation began to be for the NHS. And there have no doubt been other uh, charitable activities and donations. And people are asking, where has this money gone? Now, I know you don't run the health service, I wish you did, uh, but do you have any idea how I should answer them? George, thanks very much for having me back. Pleasure to be with you. And I think it's a, it's a very interesting and, and crucial point. The NHS, everyone feels it currently to be cash strapped and under resourced. And that's particularly evident on the front line where for many years we've seen clinics cut, services cut, waiting lists introduced by stealth really because of under capacity, beds cut, 
you know, peripheral estates being sold off, hospitals being redeveloped under PFI. So there's always a feeling that there's under-resourcing, but the actual budget, the amount the state puts into the NHS is large. It's over 120, towards 130 billion pounds a year. So that clearly would dwarf any amount that is being raised in charitable efforts. And it's laudable to see the efforts of whether it's Captain Tom or anyone else who wants to raise money for the NHS. They do so often for specific appeals. Sometimes hospitals will have local scanner appeals or appeals uh, for the vascular service who want to get certain research funding. So there's all kinds of charity associated with medicine. All of it shows the love the people have for the NHS, as does the clapping for the NHS and all of those initiatives. But what we have to be very careful of is that the wool is not being pulled over our eyes, because really the main challenge and the main drain on the NHS's resources is not of even this order of magnitude of a few million here and there, but there are billions which are being directly passed through the NHS to massive private conglomerate companies, both of capital in redeveloping the NHS, particularly with PFI. And we've talked about that before, but where 12 billion was lent to the NHS, but the NHS will have to repay over 92 billion. And that is being repaid from the actual current account of hospitals who are currently having to rent their premises. And at the end of their 40 or 60 year mortgages, they will not own those premises. They will still remain the property of those private companies. So there's a huge amount of, frankly, robbery uh, that goes on in the NHS. I, I can't tell you, George, exactly where the 20 or 30 million that Captain Tom will raise will end up. And certainly we should ask and ask to know. But what's clear is it's not going to fill a hole um, the, you know, the size of the very real schemes, which we're told were given to introduce market efficiency, to make the NHS more efficient, more responsive, to make our money go further. But really, that's not the way private capital operates. If, if, if private capital invests, it expects a return. If private capital invests in a, a public service, the NHS, prisons, schools, and it's happening throughout our libraries, happening throughout our public services, they expect a return. And that return comes from the, the budget of government. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a false economy. And in fact, it, it really amounts to a huge robbery. And, and probably the only rational demand um, to right that wrong is to simply say we demand that our government cancels those PFI contracts. Um, exactly where the money for, 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 from Captain Tom and other fundraising going, goes, you can find from a freedom of information request and perhaps that we can organize that. I do not know at this stage uh, where that money is. A lot of it would be with his website that raised it. And no doubt he's looking for the right person to pass it on to. And we should ask. But it's never going to be of the order of magnitude of the massive schemes of privatization, which are the real assault upon the NHS and other public services. It's worth making the point uh, in terms of balance that the greatest spike in these so-called PFI deals, public-private partnerships, came not under Boris Johnson or Theresa May or David Cameron, but came under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, the so-called Labour prime ministers. It's absolutely right. It's not a point that um, anyone who supports the Labour Party ever wants to hear. And I'm afraid that's been a point which has um, scuppered the movement to defend the NHS precisely because Unfortunately, many people who engage in these activities are very partisan and they wish to push a point in favour of Labour or in favour of the Tory party. And that was the case with the junior doctors strike when really it should have been about defending the NHS, defending public services, defending the pain conditions of those who work within them. Uh, many people who got involved with that strike were more in, uh, um, in favour of just promoting the interests of a Labour party government as the solution to all problems, which I'm afraid that government quite clearly shows it wasn't. You're right. I, I used to think that they initiated PFI. In fact, probably the first contracts were put forward by John Major, but they were hugely unpopular and they were pretty much mothballed. And it was Tony Brown, uh, sorry, T Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, uh, and their uh, health minister, Frank Dobson, and later Alan Mid Milburn, who were the absolute champions of PFI. And they pumped, you know, billions of dollars uh, or billions of pounds of private capital uh, because they could get these 
the hospitals then rebuilt, apparently off the budget sheet. So avoiding the accusation that Labour was the party of spending. But the deals were so angled that they were kind of irresistible to private capital because they didn't carry any risk. They could actually develop them off the uh, uh, off their balance sheet. So they weren't liable to taxes. They got, you know, tens of millions of pounds in, in, in tax relief while they were building these hospitals. And they are still recouping the benefit and they expect to do so for many years to come. It's 12 or 13, perhaps 15 billion soon a year, a year which is being paid to these private consortia from the state budget, not just for NHS, but for many different uh, companies. And it'll be 350 or 400 billion in total that the state uh, is liable for uh, when they got um, perhaps 70 billion overall. And it's not just the NHS, it's schools, hospitals, yeah. uh, prisons. It's, it's, it's many different um, streams of funding. And of course, the money that's being spent on paying these interest charges, paying the rent, as it were, is money that cannot then be spent uh, on nurses and doctors and ventilators and uh, all the things that we need in the uh, NHS. Let me move on, though, if I may, doctor. Uh, Roche has come up with, uh, an, uh, they say, a 100% successful antibodies test. Uh, which can test whether or not you have had the coronavirus. When are we likely to see that? And doesn't the fabulous profit that will be made from this welcome development and the even more fabulous profit that will be made if and when a vaccine for the coronavirus is found, buttress the call that you and I both have made separately and together that the pharmaceutical industry should have been a part of the health service right from the very beginning. That's absolutely right, George. So, I mean, always happy when there are advances in medicine that might benefit the population, always happy. But of course, you know, no one in this day and age should be dying of malnutrition and simple infections related to malnutrition. But we know 14 million children a year do die. So unfortunately, under the current system, when medicines are available, when technology is available, they don't reach and treat the global population precisely because so much of the global population is impoverished. And yes, um, the drug drugs burden, even for a developed country like Britain in the National Health Service, is very considerable, 20 or 25 billion a year. And yes, Roche, I'm very happy they've developed a test. It's dangerous to say 100% uh, sensitive, 100% specific. Every test has a certain degree of specific, specific, <laughs> specificity and sensitivity. And, and those things may be very, very high, and I'm sure the test is good. But it's not the first person to develop an antibody test. Those were developed very rapidly in Korea. They were developed in China and they've been developed elsewhere. We at one stage said we had three and a half million, but they were given back because they didn't work. But details about that were not published. And I still don't know actually where those three and a half million tests were secured from and then returned. So the point is really to control as far as we do need mass testing. So I'm happy if that can um, be put into effect. But yes, why is it that we don't have a national um, laboratory, a, a national uh, medical development uh, company, a national development uh, sector that is unable to provide these um, and, and roll them out for the benefit of the population? And then that huge debt burden would become a source of income for the general population mm. rather than a source of our indebtedness. Well, especially as the universities are paid for by us and by our students who go there, but the state is responsible for our university sector, which is where all these clinicians and scientists, researchers are being trained. I mean, if we had this uh, in our own hands, it wouldn't just be saving a huge sum of money for the NHS, it would be a better guarantor that we weren't then putting junk into people uh, just for the sake of making a profit from it or uh, because we'd already invested so much in producing it, we had to use it. Well, I think there's a lot in that, George. Um, uh, essentially, uh, why, why should it be the case that um, only certain 
avenues are funded. I mean, uh, so not all scientists are employed in the university sector. Many are, all, all were trained there. Many are employed by private companies. But the interest of private companies, there's a conflict. Yes, they need a useful product. It has to serve some purpose. But what they'd really like is a particular kind of medicine that needs to be taken in perpetuity. And, and there is an example of a, of a, of a colleague, a professor of mine, who invented um, a drug for acidity in the stomach, um, essentially the precursor of a meprazole. And he was phoned up by uh, essentially a Wall Street broker who heard that he was going to develop this medicine and wanted to know whether you could take a one-off dose and that would cure the problem or whether you'd have to take it in perpetuity. And when he said, well, you'd have to keep on taking it, he said, thank you very much. And that then became the source of a huge money-spinning drug because you can keep on selling it. And in the United States, there are many people who are in their 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s. They can't retire because the cost of their medicines is so prohibitive. They have to keep on working just to you know, keep themselves in pills to preserve their health, which is a terrible situation to be in. So the, the kind of medicines which are uh, um, uh, uh, invested in are those which are going to make the most profit. Me medicines which um, can be used, which are cheap and effective and don't make profit, uh, are unfavored. And equally, preventative medicine and you know, it links up very much with food, housing, all kinds of conditions which can make for a healthy lifestyle uh, are neglected. So uh, the entire uh, way in which we approach health and sustainable living um, is you know, the priorities are very much wrong when private profit, profit and private investment um, are the driver and motivator for production, George. And sanitation, doctor, finally. Uh my children actually cried this week, so much so that I then had to become a donor uh, to WaterAid. By a WaterAid commercial or broadcast that showed that in this world of plenty, where billionaires proliferate, 800 children every single day die from drinking dirty water. Imagine how much sickness and death we could prevent if the world was run on a different basis to that which it is. I think that's absolutely right. Well, there are one, if you can believe this figure, there are one billion people, George, a thousand million people in our world today who don't have access, adequate access to clean drinking water. There are a similar number who go to bed hungry every day. Um, there are a similar number who have inadequate or basically are, are, are homeless. Um, and to then think about, for example, we you know, generally talk about the coronavirus pandemic, to think about limiting the effects or bringing the benefits of modern um, medicine is, it, it, it's farcical, George. Um, so a system which polarizes wealth in so few hands that Jeff Bezos is shortly expected to become a trillionaire, to have a yeah, thousand yeah. billion dollars. Um, whereas, on the other hand, you know, there are literally uh, half the world's population who live on two dollars or less uh, a day uh, is, a, is a system which is totally unsustainable and gives rise to so many of the problems we have and, and in, equally has a massive impact upon coronavirus. It's terrible to hear that the numbers are increasing in India. I think there's already a gross underestimation of the numbers because essentially there's a there's an edict that really public testing shouldn't be done even when patients are turning up to government hospitals with pneumonia they're not really being adequately tested so and despite that numbers are increasing at an alarming rate and i think that is going to be a real worry so except it, are, except in kerala doctor true very true and and for the reasons you've mentioned before where if you actually mobilize the population on a public health basis, even a poor country can respond incredibly well to this public health emergency and others when resources are shared well, distribution, distributed fairly, and human life is put first on the agenda rather than profit making, the response is much better. And it's much of that that underlie, underlay rather the very poor initial response of our own government. I've got to read you this email. You know I think you're wonderful. But Tony says, offer Dr. Ranjit one of your hats. That's a lockdown haircut, if ever I saw one. <laughs> Thank you. No it's my wife's haircut, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Ranjit Brar. My wife nearly took my ear off. She is from uh, the Netherlands. I thought she was doing a, a Van Gogh. Uh, Goodwill is on the line from Nuneaton. Goodwill, welcome. 
Yeah, thank you very much, George. How are you? By the grace of God, I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, I've been following you for a while, and I appreciate what you're doing, so keep on. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Yeah, I have, I have three questions here that I would like to ask you. The first one is about vaccination and Bill Gates. I heard you, I think it was last week or the week before, somebody asked a similar question. So I'll ask you again, why, why should we believe or trust Bill Gates when we've seen so many videos and uh, I think they're legit he, for, of him talking about um, uh, the world being overpopulated and he believes that the world is overpopulated and population is a problem. So why is he trying to save people when he thinks the world is overpopulated? That's my first question. Okay, let um, me deal with that one uh, first. Uh, who's asking you to trust Bill Gates, a computer manufacturer? Certainly not me. Uh, and his repugnant views on uh, the world's population are just that. They are repugnant. Uh, the notion that there are too many people in the world is totally absurd. All of the people in Britain could go and stand shoulder to shoulder on the Isle of Wight. It's completely untrue that the world is full. What is true is that the wealth of the world is grotesquely maldistributed. So yeah. I've got nothing to do with uh, Bill Gates, but Bill Gates is just a very rich man who's given away a very large part of his fortune because he's realized that having influence and admiration in the world is much more uh, pleasant uh, than, uh, than having still more hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, but it's not Bill Gates that's going to be giving my child a vaccine. It's the National Health Service. And if my doctor, may God preserve her, uh, who un undoubtedly is listening tonight, if my doctor tells me uh, that this vaccine is safe for your child, I'm going to trust her uh, because I love her and she's my doctor. And she has my best yeah. interests at heart. So this is all, this is a chimera. Bill Gates is the new George Soros, is the new Rothschild, that all the conspiracy theorists have fetishized in their minds and concentrated all of their justifiable skepticism about the profit motive in medicine, which you've just heard me discuss with Dr. Ranjit, as a curse. You're, over to you, Goodwill. Yeah, I agree with most of what you say. Uh, the, the, the main question was about trusting the very people that, they, 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 that believe the world is overpopulated and them trying to see the world when they think it's overpopulated. We know, we know there's a lot of conspiracy theories, and, and, but they, they can be easily justified. Bill Gates is there in Africa trying to save loads of people while he's is thinking they are overpopulated. Yeah, yeah. That was my it's, first uh, it's contradictory. Yeah. You. It's absolutely it, it doesn't make It doesn't make any sense. No. Good. Well, so, I need to press on, mate, because there's lots of people trying to get through. I'm grateful for your call. Mark is in North Carolina. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, how you doing, George? Good. George, Good, uh, I'm fine. Thank you. Great, great, great to hear. George, first of all, um, I just want to comment on what we were talking about before about the nursing homes. I just made a YouTube uh, video yesterday. I've got a YouTube channel, and I um, was talking about uh, Gov New York Governor Andrew Cuomo and another governor, I believe, a couple other governors in Pennsylvania and uh, New Jersey, but the worst is New York. Uh, Cuomo admitted to making a mistake about putting uh, – infected people with COVID-19 into nursing homes, okay? But you see, I put it in my video, I don't believe it's a mistake. Uh, in order to be a mistake, Cuomo would have to be completely stupid. I mean, on the verge of, well, I can't say the word here, I guess, but... Uh, really, but but he, our, he, our, he, our he, government, he our government did the same thing, Mark. Okay, yeah, okay. 
But this is the deal. See, I follow a lot of this stuff with you talk about Bill Gates and Malthus, okay? And a lot of there's a lot of people involved in that kind of thinking. I don't believe it was by accident. I think Cuomo purposely infected these nursing homes. They want to clean the slate. They want to kill these people, period. All right? I'm sorry. You may not like for me to say that, but this is what I believe. I believe these people are not just are not stupid. I believe many of them are out now evil. And that gets me to Bill Gates. Um, Gates, is, Gates has his hand in these vaccines. There's no question about it. Many people in India and Africa have been crippled, killed, and sterilized from this monster's vaccine. I he doesn't make vaccines, Mark. Okay, but he's involved in it. Okay? He's involved in pushing them, that's all. He doesn't make them. Okay. They're okay. not his I'm, vaccines. What I'm for. They belong to Roche or Smith Klein Beecham or one of the uh, vast uh, uh, the chemical industrial complex. Well, I don't trust them either. But what I would do, if it's up to me, I would confiscate these billionaires' money, most of it at least. I wouldn't do it, you know, just outright take it. I would, you know, tax them like 20 to 30 percent a year. I tax their wealth. I'm talking about their actual accumulated wealth. 20 to 30 percent a year, and I tax their income like 95 to 99 percent of their income every year until we brought them down to society. Because these are predators, and they use their money as weapons to control everything, including the corrupt people that govern the United States and Britain, it seems like, too. Okay? That's my problem. All right? You want to call me a socialist? Fine. What's your, uh, what's your YouTube channel called, Mark? I'd like to watch your video. Okay, my name is Mark, M-A-R-K, my last name, should I get my last name? Yeah. S-C-H-E-E-R, Shear, and you'll see my picture on it. it was in a, uh, Mark Shear. You'll see my picture on it. So there's, a couple of, yeah, there's a couple of different Shear, S-C-H, two E's in there are, and you'll see my picture. I'm wearing, like, sunglasses, and I'm wearing, like, a watch cap. I think okay. I'm wearing, like, yeah, I'm I'll, wearing, like, a watch I'll, cap. I'll, in there. I promise you, okay. I'll, look, I'll look during the week uh, for that. It's been a pleasure be talking proud, to you. I'd be proud to have you as a subscriber, you know? Okay, really. I'll subscribe. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. Let's take a quick break. Radio Sputnik. Tune in every Wednesday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker and John Kiriakou for a regular segment called Beyond Nuclear, where Brian and John discuss nuclear issues, including weapons, energy, waste, and the future of nuclear technology in the United States with Kevin Camps, the radioactive waste watchdog at the organization Beyond Nuclear. Listen on Wednesdays right here on Radio Sputnik. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. Okay, let's, uh, let's get as many calls, please, Chris, uh, in the last half hour uh, that we can. I'm not going to do a hall of fame and a wall of shame, but I'll tell you what I am going to do. I'm going to remove somebody from the hall of fame uh, because he has turned out not only to be a disappointment, but to have betrayed his mission and betrayed those who followed him in pursuit of that mission. And so the one announcement I'm going to make on the Hall of Fame this evening is that I'm going to remove Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont from the Hall of Fame. Be gone, Senator Sanders. We no longer want to look upon you or, frankly, hear from you ever again. Let's take a call from Dennis in Texas who wants to talk about Scottish independence. Oh, there's a bolt from the blue. Dennis, go ahead, my friend. Uh, hello, George. It's an honor to get through. My first time uh, trying to call you. Welcome. Uh, you don't sound yeah, like a Texan. Uh, no, I'm English. Okay. I'm not Scottish. Okay, welcome. Uh, welcome. There's one major disagreement, only one actually, the only thing I can think of that I can disagree with you strongly on, and that is mm -hmm. your antithesis to uh, Scottish independence. And I'm English, but I'm utterly in favour of it, and I'd like you to come to my side. Well, because I think that the working class in Scotland has much more in common with the working class in England uh, than it has with the Scottish landowners, the Scottish industrialists and financiers and the people who have ruled and ruined 
uh, Scotland. I think that a bus driver in Bathgate has far more in common with a bus driver in Birmingham uh, than with other Scots who exploit bus drivers. Uh, the same kind of people who exploit uh, the bus drivers in both countries. I believe that it would be, I'll let you back in, uh, I believe that it would be against the interests of the Scottish working people uh, to erect a partition uh, across the border uh, between two parts of a small island of English-speaking people. I think that's very foolish, stupid. Of course, the Scots have a right to it, if they vote for it, they must have it. And if they did, I'd move back and ply my trade there. Uh, but it's my duty to tell the people of Scotland what I honestly think. And what I honestly think is that that would not be in their interests. And certainly would not be in the interests of the people of Newcastle and Sunderland, the people of Liverpool and Birmingham. Uh, it would uh, actually abandon them. Uh, to the worst excesses uh, of the uh, Tories and the capitalist system. So I believe, uh, for now, uh, that the working people of this small island are best together. And if that changes, I'll let you know. Last word to you, Dennis. Well, that's the line I wasn't expecting from you, George. But, uh, uh, actually, I was coming around to your opinion on Brexit after being against it, but after seeing how Germany treated Italy with all the coronavirus, which pretty much ignored them. OK, uh, Dennis, uh, there's so many calls, uh, I'm going to have to press on. Thanks for that. Dennis in Texas on Scottish independence. All human life is here. Jared is in Pennsylvania. Go ahead, Jared. Hello, George, and God bless. Thank you, sir. Take that. Uh, I'm calling about the recent string of attacks on workers in Pennsylvania, but not the way you're thinking, like physical, actual attacks, assaults on workers telling people to come into stores wearing masks. I've had, I, there was a cop who just recently came into my store yesterday, and he told me that at um, a local Wegmans, they were throwing literal beer cans at each other because they didn't want, he didn't want to put his mask on. And also, two associates at a, another Rite Aid pharmacy that I work at were also assaulted. So this, this is getting completely out of hand with this just, um, I, I don't even know what to describe it, uh, these, these, um, these uh, uh, freedom absolutists almost. Yeah, that well, don't uh, wear Jared, a I'll tell you what, Jared, be grateful they didn't uh, unleash their automatic weapons, uh, which, of course, uh, many of these uh, freedom warriors are carrying around with them. I've got to press on because of the hour, and I've literally got 25 callers. I'm going to try and get through 15. Jared, thank you. Mike is in the Bahamas. That's irresistible. Yes, hi. That's irresistible. How are you? I, my first ever call from the Bahamas. Welcome, Mike. You're my favorite politician, bar none. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyway, I'm actually um, American and UK dual national. Okay. Obviously born and raised in America. Okay. Um, I want to know, did you see that BBC series, Years and Years? Uh, I didn't actually, no. Uh, Forgive me. Okay. At the beginning of episode five, there's this uh, populist fascist PM who gets elected, and there's this Scottish radio announcer who's um, uh, criticizing the government and gets uh, carried off by thugs during the um, during his radio program. And wow. you have to be the inspiration for wow. that. That's amazing. So actually, years, it's called I emailed years and you. Years. Yes, and I emailed you a little snippet. And if you go 70 seconds into it, there's 70 seconds into the fifth episode. I mean, the guy doesn't look like you, but with the Scottish accent, it has to be you. Well, I'll, I'll listen to it, and if possible, we'll play it next week, Mike. Yes, uh, I think you should be able to play it. I don't know if there's any legal issues. There may, there BBC, may be, but... there, there may be uh, copyright issues, yeah. But I'll summarize it anyway. Uh, okay, last word from you, Mike. Yes, um, you had the that person, I can't remember what her name was. Rachel, um, Rachel Blevins. Rachel Yes, um, I actually disagree with her because it seems like the Democrats have nominated the only person who could lose to Donald Trump. I think you've got it, mate. That's exactly 
correct. Mike, I need to press on. Hope. Do, uh, oh. do forgive me, please, because Joshua is in London, and I want to take him next. Joshua, go ahead. You right, George? How's it going? Yes, it's a very busy show tonight. Thank you. Press on. Yeah, I was just going to ask about the failed coup in Venezuela. Now, Venezuela is broken back to an extent. Uh, it's it's in quite a lot of quite a dire situation. How is it that America failed to successfully stage a coup there now? And yet it was so successful in doing so in Chile in 1973 against a government that was maybe not that well entrenched, but certainly in a better position in Chile then than the Venezuelan government is now. Well, uh, the, key any... di the key difference is that the Chilean army uh, was acting in concert with the United States and it was the army that carried out the coup. Uh, the Venezuelan uh, army is loyal to the state and to the constitution and to the elected president. So that's the uh, key difference. But the overarching difference is that the, uh, the United States of 1973 is not the United States of 2020. Uh, the United States is far, far weaker politically in terms of its soft power, in terms of its own political uh, stability, uh, but most crucially, its economic strength. The United States had uh, only one rival that was already sinking uh, towards extinction in 1973. Now the United States is being rapidly overtaken uh, by uh, the rivals that are coming, coming out, popping up everywhere. That's the main difference, Joshua. Yeah, no, no, I, I understand. I just, I just, I sometimes think it's a bit of a random, almost arbitrary process where you have a failed Bay of Pigs invasion named at Topping Castro, and yet over a decade later you have like a successful coup against Chile, mm. but then you have a sort of a failed coup against Venezuela. And of course, there was the successful uh, coup that the CIA staged yeah. in uh, uh, Iran and, against and, the and, yeah. and, do, and do bear in mind, Joshua, that the Venezuela story is not over yet, I'm afraid. Let's hear from Nestor in Maryland. Go ahead, Nestor. Hello? Nestor in Maryland, please. Ah, okay, sorry. Next one is Darren in Glasgow. Go ahead, Darren. Hi, George. How are you doing? Good, good. Um, I just wanted to talk about universal basic income. I know it's something that you're not a very big fan of, but I think in this growing world of automation and massive job losses, I think it's something that governments globally are going to have to consider, especially during this pandemic where we're seeing companies are finding new ways to operate, uh, new ways to, you know, to automate their business. Um, so I just want your opinion on universal basic income. Uh, yeah, I, do I, don't, uh, I don't myself uh, have the same faith in uh, the uh, brave new world of uh, artificial intelligence and robots and so on that you do. I don't believe that. No, no, that, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. I don't artificial think... intelligence is not automation. No, the, the uh, no but, but I'm familiar with your work, of course, as you know. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, extent to which robots and artificial intelligence and automation are going to take away uh, people's work and livelihoods. Uh, well, is, let's take driverless cars, for example. Yeah, I don't believe... Uh, the, no, there, but I don't believe that. I don't believe that there will be driverless cars. I don't believe there will be there driverless delivery crazy. drivers. No, the technology... Happens. You have to let me speak. The technology exists for these things, but the sociology does not. People will not get in a driverless taxi. No one will trust it. Uh, people will not get in a driverless bus. Uh, and they'd be right not to trust it. So, of course, you can describe the advances in technology that can make all kinds of things possible. But that's a different thing uh, from them being politically, sociologically acceptable. Anyway, I promise you we will discuss UBI. Uh, on another occasion, but it really isn't the subject uh, for this evening. I want to speak to Nestor in Maryland. Go ahead, Nestor. Uh, yes, uh, 
Go ahead, Nesta. Uh, hope you got, okay, hope you guys are doing well. Um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to call and uh, kind of reinforce the point you've been making uh, and also how bizarre it looks to me every time uh, you have a caller that calls in and, you know, starts to argue for the economy. Uh, and, you know, all they're doing is beating around the bush just to say that they want to die for money. You know, they, they should just call in and say, I want to die for money, George. I want to die. I want my neighbors to die for money. Uh, I want my neighborhood to die for money. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what well, they're saying. Well, I, 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 I think you're right. I did refer to false consciousness earlier. Do you know something, Nestor? We could keep up the furlough of 80%, should be more, uh, of the wages of every worker in this country for until the end of this year for 78 billion pounds. We handed out 500 billion pounds to the banks to stop them crashing in the 2008-2009 crisis. So what we've actually got people saying is send me back to work rather than pay me to stay at home in order that I should still be alive. And that's just crazy, Nestor. It's crazy in offering yourself exactly. up as a sacrifice like that. Even worse, offering up your neighbor and still worse, offering up your own children. Nestor, last word. Uh, exactly, George. And, you know, I hope uh, we keep on having this conversation and get through to people because this kind of mentality is so dangerous, especially with what's going on with China and the U.S. and the, and the, and the potential for another world war. Uh, with people with this mindset, you know, I can already hear the arguments for people saying why they should go to war. Nestor, wonderful call. Thank you very much in Maryland. David's in Chicago. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, David. George, it's such an honor talking to you. I've been following you and listening to you since 2003. Wow, thank um, you very your, much. Yes, uh, yes, your position on the uh, illegal, immoral Iraq war uh, that uh, my country and your country waged and killed hundreds of thousands of people. That's not what I'm calling about. I'm calling about I have six children. Um, <clears throat> one of them is an adult now. Uh, the other five uh, are still in school. And, uh, well, we've got a lot in when, common. When, uh, in, in two months, I'll have six children, and one of them's an adult now. Many congratulations in Thank advance. You. That's Thank wonderful. You. God bless the you. Thanks. Children are just a wonderful thing to have. Absolutely. On January 21st, um, when I heard the news about the uh, uh, coronavirus uh, uh, victim in Washington, the first time uh, I heard about it, a few days later, I, I had to sit there. I, I was thinking really hard and I just had a feeling this is going to become a pandemic so I decided to go ahead and pull my kids out of school and naturally the school district uh, waged a war on me uh, for the following and, and you know for, for weeks telling me that I was doing the wrong thing and of course legally in the state that I live in I have the right to pull my kids out of school anytime and homeschool them and uh, you know I was told by the uh, school superintendent that there's no way that we're going to get in Illinois they were convinced that this that Corona was never going to come to Illinois. Um, I'm just, and today, you, you, you know, on your poll, I answered uh, absolutely not. There was no way I would send my kids back. The only way I would send my kids back, um, if, if, you know, there is a vaccine that's safe and has to be uh, uh, certified by the WHO, because I don't trust uh, our government here. Um, and, I, I'm, and I'm finding that many, many of my friends don't trust this government. They didn't trust this government when Obama was president. We, we don't. We definitely don't trust it now that we got this buffoon in the White House. Totally so, brilliant, um, brilliant call, David. David, one of the best calls of the night. I love you. Thank you so much. Don't be a stranger. Call back soon. Neil is in London. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, Neil. Thank you, George. I've um, been a fan of yours since your firebrand articulated assaults on Parliament were years ago. I think Thank your you. talents uh, are wasted that you should be actually teaching Parliament how to speak. Thank you, sir. Very kind of you to say. So, um, my question here is um, regarding something that seems to be missing in the dialogue of the governments worldwide with regards to COVID-19. And that is um, 
that the method on which someone, you know, survives it is through their immunity. I was wondering, why isn't there anything um, advised to the population on supporting their immune system and showing people how to improve it so that they, we get through this pandemic? That's and a very good it. point. Uh, there, there's, there's nothing holistic about the way in which the government are treating this. Uh, nothing at all. Everything they could have done, uh, they didn't, and everything they did, they shouldn't. It has been a farce. It has been a calamity from uh, start how, to finish. Now, there's a lot, you... there's a lot of uh, immunosuppressant life factors that can't be changed in an instant. Uh, it is an issue that so many people in Britain are obese. It is an issue uh, that so many people in Britain still smoke uh, and so on, although um, nicotine appears to be a repellent uh, to COVID-19 at least, uh, but it's certainly not a healthy way to live. And I speak as one who lived unhealthily with smoke uh, for decades. Uh, th these are things that can't be done overnight. Uh, but we never hear anything about the way in which people could strengthen their immune system. Give us a couple of quick suggestions. Well, my way that I do it is I take um, an organic vitamin C daily, um, and I take um, selenium, uh, zinc, and magnesium. And it, it, and it goes with vitamin D3, and those basics are the ones that you start with um, going along to the road to health. But the problem I'm asking is why isn't there not a word about it worldwide? I, don't, I can't speak for worldwide. I certainly agree with you that it isn't spoken about nearly enough uh, here. Neil, thanks for the call. Wayne is in Cheshire. Go ahead, Wayne. Hello, hello. <clears throat> I've been um, <clears throat> listening to the show this evening and a couple of things come to mind. The first one is about the Eton <clears throat> Harrow and the, um, the, the, private, the private schools, yeah. Yeah, well, a lot of them are um, on the highlands of Scotland. Anyway, the question <clears throat> I want to know, I'd love to know, is how have they come to that conclusion about opening in September? Was it pressure off the parents, or do they know something we don't know? I would now, think it's common, <laughs> it's common sense. Uh, they're applying common sense, and the government is not applying common sense when it comes to state school children. Right. Now, this is a good uh, connected uh, information. I don't need to know this, but a number of the government scientists which advise the government have resigned and they've gone off on their own with their own group because the chairman of their new group said they've been giving information to the government but not doing as what they should have done to do with the public. But it's very hard to get information of what they're actually saying now because they want to give us the truth of their scientific research. Thank you, Wayne in Cheshire. Clear the lines. There's a legend on the floor. Norma in Bristol. Go ahead, Norma. Hello, George. Hi. Um, I heard this um, very intelligent young man last night posing this question. He said that the rich list that's published, because that's public at the moment, every year may be of interest, but he's heard that Tony Benn once said wouldn't it be a better idea to publish annually the number of people suffering from poverty, bad housing... A poor housing list. Things. A poor list. Yeah. Yes. And then... That'd be a help, long list, though, Norma. Yeah, but then help to try and rectify this situation by updating that every year, you know? It's a very good, um, a very, very good suggestion. I didn't know that Mr. Ben had uh, suggested that. It's a very good idea. And the other quick thing is, if there's now a vacancy on the Hall of Fame, may I suggest they stick you in and get Bernie off? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Very kind of you, dear Norma. Stay uh, safe. By the way, I've just been reminded, you may say I shouldn't have had to be reminded, uh, that my appearance at the US Senate was 15 years ago this very day. And I suspect uh, I've been reminded of it uh, by... Uh, Ron Mackay, our editor, who was the distinguished-looking gentleman, uh, sat next to me, the one with the silver hair, who looked like he could have been a senator himself. Uh, it was my finest hour. 
I don't think there's any doubt about that. It brought me to widespread American attention and to worldwide uh, attention because every camera from every country in the world was there in the Senate room. And I made the point at the time, forgive me if you've heard me say it before, but when I was young, I was a boxer. And so I was aware uh, that there is a moment in a fight uh, when you can see in your opponent's eyes uh, that they no longer want to be there. And I saw that light in the eyes of the senators that were seeking to persecute me. I saw the light die in their eyes, the light of wishing uh, to carry on with the proceedings. But unfortunately for them, the entire world's media had been assembled. And I could almost hear them thinking, whose idea was this? As George W. Bush uh, might have put it, uh, they misunderestimated me. Who is this council house, Torag, uneducated, Tag, that has turned up here in front of we princes of the U.S. Senate and is knocking hell out of us on primetime television? Who is this man? Thought he had never been to university, no Harvard, no Yale, no Oxford, no Cambridge, no nothing, educated uh, Michelin tires in Dundee, sadly soon to close. Uh, it was a remarkable uh, occasion, uh, one which was almost dreamlike in its uh, quality. Uh, but I knew that I had done well when I came out of the Senate committee room and a black janitor. It's the first time it ever happened to me. A black janitor high-fived me in the corridor and said, way to go, man. You just sent George Bush back to his ranch. <laughs> now, I had never heard the phrase, way to go, and I had never been high-fived. And I thought, blimey. That must have gone well, and so indeed it did. It was a seminal moment, of course, in my life. It established uh, the fact uh, that is or should be well known uh, that the highest act that one can perform is to tell the truth at the court of the Sultan. That's what I was determined to do, and by the grace of God, who gave me wings that day, I was able to do it. Now, as I said earlier, I'm speaking on Tuesday night at 8 p.m. on my Facebook, my YouTube, my Twitter, on the subject of Israel-Palestine, laying out the history, uh, but also laying out what I hope will be the future. If you're at all interested in that subject, and it's been my experience that many millions of you are, I hope you'll tune in Tuesday night at 8 p.m. I hope you get my book, which I'll have to stop signing and dedicating soon. I said I'd sign and dedicate the first 1,000. I've already done far more than that, but there it is there on the screen. If you want it dedicated and signed, then send now a message to info at georgegalloway.com or you can get it straight off Amazon, but it won't be signed and it won't be uh, dedicated. Uh, so please, because I'm nearly finished its sequel, but I can't publish the sequel until I've sold a decent number of uh, the original. The sequel's called Black Lake, by the way, and those in the West Bromwich area will know why. Well, it's been marvelous for me. I hope it was for you. My apologies if I didn't get to your call or your call was briefer than you would have liked. And my apologies if I didn't get to your social media message. My message is, please come back next week at the same time, in the same place, 
and bring another viewer, another listener with you. May God go with all of you. Stay safe. It's been marvelous.